Hi there. Welcome to season three of But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. My name is Bert Scholl. I'm a two-time cancer survivor, a cancer survivorship coach, and the creator and host of But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast. To learn more about my coaching services, please go to BertScholl.com. That's B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-L-L.com. You can also provide feedback on the podcast by going to the BertScholl.com contact page and filling out the contact form. We love your feedback. Really, we would. And make sure to check out our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash but seriously the cancer podcast. Today's guest is Bethany Webb. Bethany is a mindset coach, a cancer thriver, and author of her first book, or as she puts it, her first book baby, My Guru Cancer. A big proponent of living life to the fullest, Bethany is on a mission to help others find freedom with everything life brings, especially those curveballs. What I enjoyed most about the conversation with Bethany was how grateful she is for where she is today and her understanding that she would not have gotten here had she not been diagnosed with cancer. Bethany has been cancer free for five years. Hey, Bethany, how are you? I'm doing awesome. So happy to be here. (laughs) Uh, I'm so glad you agreed to it. Thanks so much. So you were diagnosed with breast cancer, yeah? Yes, five years ago. Five years ago. How old were you? 34. It was actually a few weeks after my 34th birthday. Happy birthday. (laughs) Yeah, I was diagnosed like two or three weeks before my 37th birthday. Then we had a birthday party. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, I did too. (laughs) Five years ago, you said, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And how was it discovered? Oh, I found my own lumps. Yeah, I actually, I started getting lumps in my breasts in my late 20s. And of course, the first time that I had one, it was a complete panic attack. I didn't realize you could have a lump in your breast and it not be cancer. Mm. And so I would go to the doctors and, and usually when you're under the age of 40, you'll get an ultrasound. And it was always determined there was a swollen cyst or a lymph node. And so I learned just to monitor them over time, you know, what to feel for. And, and this was actually the lump I didn't get checked out right away. The only one. I found it a year prior. Yeah, I didn't take it to the doctors. I was like, ah, it's just another sister, lymph node, whatever. I don't feel like dealing with this. I feel great. I'm a healthy person. I practice yoga and eat organic. There's no way I have cancer. So it wasn't until almost a year later that lump started getting bigger and I felt one then in my armpit. And so I was like, oh, that that's different. And then Mm. a very close friend of mine, who's also a yoga teacher, young, super healthy. She was diagnosed with a really rare form of soft tissue cancer that was in her hamstring. And she just had a tight hamstring and this pain that wouldn't go away. And it was this aggressive tumor. And so when she was diagnosed, it was like, ah, okay, maybe I'm not so exempt from from cancer after all. I should get this checked out, and I'm so happy that I did. <laughs> yeah, so you had lumps in your breast since you were 20, and you got so accustomed to them that when you had this one at age yeah. 34, actually maybe it would have been 33. It was 33 when I first, yeah. And the conversation of cancer showed up in your life with a friend, and you decided I better get this checked out. Mm-hmm. It was a few months before I was diagnosed that she was. And she also went public with her diagnosis. And I found it to be just so amazing and encouraging. And it really helped spread that awareness. So that was another motivator for me to do the same. Um, she's no longer with us. She, she passed away within five months after being oh, I'm diagnosed. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, so it's the first cancer friend to, to pass away. And I was just like, oh, my God, this, this thing is... <laughs> This is real. <laughs> this is really something that, yeah. yeah, can take over a healthy body quickly. And so it really motivated me to do everything that I could to to take care of it. And you went public, you said? Yeah, I call it that. <laughs> I did. You know, I had such an interesting experience during the diagnostic phase of cancer. So, you know, it takes a while to, to know if it's cancer. And I don't know if that was the case for you as well. It's, you know, not like you go into the doctor and find out that day. There's usually a series of tests. So I had, um, I had actually worked with a naturopath at first because I was really afraid of Western medicine and mammograms. I had done ultrasound, but not a mammogram before. So, Mm -hmm. and he did, it's called digital breast thermography uh, to measure the heat in my breasts. And that can tell you if something's cancerous or not. And, and it showed no signs of cancer. 
which I celebrated, of course. And then the lumps just kept getting bigger. And I was like, Ugh, I'm not feeling comfortable about this. And, and he did another round of those scans and showed no cancer again. And so I'm just really happy something in me kicked in that said, you know what, go, go keep getting things checked out further with, with the support of Western medicine. And I'm so happy I did. His advice was to come back in six months and I would have likely have been stage four by then at the rate that the cancer was growing. So mm. super grateful. I, I turned it over to to Western medicine and it was a combination of a mammogram ultrasound and then a biopsy is, is what confirmed it. But in that period of time, you know, it's so interesting because I, I feel like I was trained almost to, to go through cancer. Like my background is in yoga therapy. Um, I had just become certified in this mindfulness practice called the work of Byron Katie, which can help you deal with any type of stress in life you know, I knew how to live a healthy lifestyle. And so it felt like I was trained for it. But the ironic part is in that diagnostic phase, I just, I threw every piece tool out the window, like didn't do <laughs> shit. And I went down, like it was, it was amazing. The emotional roller coaster that I, I hit just, just, yeah, it took, I spiraled down and was terrified and panicked and anxious and, not motivated. Like I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to like crawl in bed and disappear from the world. You know, I joke, I can easily joke about it now because it was, I'm just so grateful that that happened because I was able to see so clearly what the cause of my suffering was during that time. Cause at that point I did not know if I had cancer, you know, that hadn't been proven yet. However, mm. so it, cancer could not have been the cause of my suffering. I didn't even know for sure if it was there. So the root of my suffering was everything that I was thinking and believing about cancer. So I got to see, you know, these beliefs like my life is over, you know, cancer will kill me. I'll die young. I won't be able to fulfill my dreams. This is going to make my family suffer. I'll be that sad story. People will pity me. You know, it was just this whole world was born in my head and this whole future, this whole not just any future, shitty, shitty, shitty future <laughs> in my head. And then I believed it and then I suffered. And so I hit a level of suffering where I was just like, oh my God, I've got to try something else because this is terrible and, and obviously not helpful to my body. I'm literally living in a panic attack. <laughs> and so I, I hit that level of suffering, uh, which then motivated me to to jump back into that toolbox that I had been trained in. And it was really the work of Byron Katie that I dove into then in that diagnostic phase. And so, you know, that process offers a way to question all of those stressful thoughts, you know, the, the BS, the belief systems that are running in our head. Hmm. And so I took those, those beliefs to that process. And it was so phenomenal that within probably a two week period, I went from feeling terror, complete terror, to excitement about cancer. So by the time I hit, you know, the, hearing those words, you know, yes, you have a very aggressive form of breast cancer. It's in your breast. It's spread to the lymph nodes. Hopefully it didn't take root anywhere else. We'll find out soon. When I heard those words, it did not hit me. You know, it was still shocking, of course, because I felt so healthy and normal. I didn't feel sick at all or was in zero pain. So it was shocking, but it didn't have that same soul crushing effect that I think it would have if I hadn't already worked my mind around it. I'm so grateful for that time. So within that, that's when I went public was a few weeks after that diagnosis. Cause I was just, I was inspired. I was excited. I was up late night writing and couldn't stop. And that was, you know, the start of my book was just all these realizations of how you know, the fear, the worst part of cancer was, was in my imagination, not in reality. And then I was like, well, will this hold tr true through my two year vigorous as hell, uh, treatment plan? And, and my answer is yes. You know, it did, it did hold true. I used that process for gosh, every single struggle that I went through in the cancer journey. And it, and it pulled me out not to say I didn't suffer. Hell yeah, I did. But this was a way out of it each time which was very, very comforting to have that in my little back pocket.
I love that you said, of course I suffered, but I kept finding my way out of it. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, what I found was it wasn't that I didn't go down the rabbit hole every once in a while, but I always returned to being clear about what's so. And it was a slightly different experience than yours, but ultimately it's what guided me, it's what guided you. And uh, there's so much value in that. I'm curious, you said you're excited about cancer, and I'm sure everyone listening right now is wondering, mm-hmm. what do you mean you're ex- you yeah. had excitement <laughs> about <does> cancer? <laughs> so when I started working those thoughts, like my life is over, you know, for example, and the process of the work is it's really easy. It's just asking yourself four questions and then doing some turnarounds. So the first one is, is it true? So my life is over, is it true? And it's just a yes or a no. You know, I was a yes. <laughs> like, this is all I can see right now. It's over. <laughs> and, and and even if it's not over, if I don't die, it's going to be a shitty life now that I've gone through, you know, well, I've gone through six months of aggressive chemo and new body parts and radiation. You know, it's like, it's not going to be a good one for sure. So the life as I knew it was over. <laughs> and then the second question is, can you absolutely know that it's true? And that question gets me because the word absolutely is is big. You know, that means 100% yeah. without a doubt, like it could hold up in court, true. And so that just there, you know, my life is over. Can I absolutely know it's true? And I, you know, sit in these questions like a meditation and and I, I can't. My answer is no. I, I can't know for sure. You know, I'm not a psychic. I, I don't I don't know for sure. So that just created a little bit of of an opening, you know, around that that belief system. So I can imagine listeners thinking, yeah, well, I know it's not absolutely true, but I'm pretty sure right. that my life is ruined, right? And then right? give it a yes. Yeah. And I, then you give it a yes. Oh, yeah. The, the answer, you know, it's yes or no. Both answers are equal, and it's about what's true for you. So there are many times I've been doing this practice for, God, 11 years already, and there are many times where I'm like, yes. And hell yes, it's true. Mm. <laughs> and it's still worth going through the entire process because then we step into the third question is how do you react? What happens when you believe the thought? This gets you in touch with the side effect of a belief. You know, how does it feel in your body? And and my life is over. Like I'm, I'm tensed up. I am like caving forward. I want to like curl up in a little ball. I'm not breathing fully. I have... You know, I treat myself poorly. I tell myself I should be handling it better. I should be peaceful. You know, I shouldn't freak out over nothing. Nothing's real yet. Like I, you know, I bash myself with with a belief like that. And I I move away from other people. You know, I'm short. I feel like they don't understand me. I disconnect. Mm -hmm. And, And then there's, you know, with that belief, my life is over. There's so many images in my head of past and future. And and I have, I go to the past and all the movies I've seen, cancer movies, you know, and those sad, sad moments where the blood drips out of the nose and they're carted off and everyone's around them in the hospital bed saying goodbye. And so I'd see all those past images and then there's my future. Now I'm, uh, you know, 80 pounds in the hospital with gray skin, no hair, no boobs, and everyone's sobbing around me. And so... Yeah. Oh my gosh, the pa- that's it gets you in touch with the power of a thought when you believe it. It's it's all encompassing and it's all I could see with my life is over. It's just worst case scenarios. So Yeah, you were living into an imagined future. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And feeling it now. And feeling it and living it yep. like it's real. Like it's real. And and you know, it's so valuable to sit with our responses and to recognize, okay, I could actually imagine a hundred different futures. And off the top of my head, I could probably imagine 10, but I'm living into this horrible one like it's real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that question three, again, like to me, it really gives me a direct experience with noticing the cause and effect of a thought and the effect is suffering deep suffering. Mm -hmm. So then the fourth question is another sweet space to meditate in is who would I be without the thought my life is over or whatever thought I'm working. And so the situation doesn't change. Like cancer is still growing my body. I'm going to appointments. I'm going to be, you know, diving into treatment. 
but who would I be living my life without that thought? And it was like, you know, a weight lifted <laughs> off, off of my body, off of my mind, my emotions, where I could get back in touch with the present moment, which is what's real now. And I am what's reality is I'm in a body that's healthy. Yes, it's it's grown some cancer. You know, the cancer likes my body just like I like it. I have a wonderful medical team. There's a treatment plan in place. There's like thousands of women who have done this before me that keep perfecting the treatment plan. You know, I'm, I'm watered, I'm fed, I'm sheltered. Like, it's just, you come back to right here, right now and realize, oh, this is actually like, this is okay. You know, I've got this. And, and it became a simpler, like, go into the next direction. Okay. What's the next appointment and next and became, um, a flow that, that I entered in. And then when I would look at the future without the thought, my life is over. Like I, my mind started opening up to all these other possibilities of, of how it actually could be good. You know, how it could help heal relationships, how it could give my career a new direction. You know, I was already in this line of work, but not specifically around pain and illness. So um, I started seeing like this possibility of making new connections of, you know, learning to slow down, learning to really practice all these tools that I've been preaching, you know, like, oh my God, could you actually enjoy cancer? And so that's, you know, in that experience is where that excitement, that inspiration was born because I started seeing all of the best case scenarios, you know, instead of those worst case so then I move into this last part of the practice. Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, go for it. So it sounds like when you say there was excitement about cancer and you're enjoying aspects of it, what I'm hearing you say, I want to be sure that I'm hearing mm-hmm. this accurately, is that the excitement was in part about the future you were living into. It wasn't limited to fear and anxiety and the worst possible outcome. You chose to live into a future that was you were envisioning was something that inspired you and lifted you up and brought you joy. Well, I can speak to something you just shared. So yes, like my mind became open to a friendly re- future, but I also saw that right here, right now, reality was actually much better than the thoughts in my head. Yes, so and like, that's where I was going to go. Yeah. With it, yeah. So it's both. It's like realizing reality is is okay, and and maybe it's not over the top amazing at that moment but it's it's not you know it's like body's moving breathing I don't I wouldn't even know I had cancer <laughs> you know I still felt right. like great and that's go. reality and and awesome and so it brought me back to to being rooted in reality and then from that space you know I could see all these other possible futures and I you know I joke it's like you know the future is imagination period like it will never be now. It is always imagination. So if I'm going to live in imagination, which is what we all do every day, all day, <laughs> mm-hmm. anyways, like what we're going to do this afternoon, imagination, <laughs> not real yet. So if I'm going to live in imagination, like why not live in a nice one? You know, why not imagine a good future? Uh, to me, there's no, there's no downside of that because I feel better now. But when I believed into that terrifying, my life is over, you know, uh, future, it's, I feel terrible now. You know, it's like bringing the future into the present moment. Yeah. I had uh, rectal cancer the first time I was diagnosed. And so there were side effects I was experiencing directly. Mm -hmm. However, I was also clear, as you said, my body was healthy. Mm -hmm. There was cancer in my body causing some issues. But that was distinctly different from the, you know, the wellness of my entire body. And when I was diagnosed a second time, when it metastasized my liver, I would have had no reason to know except for that I was getting my routine scans. And mm-hmm. so it sounds like you were in a healthy body. Mm-hmm. You were told there was cancer in your body and you were going to appointments and seeing doctors. And that's what was so. Which is going to appointments is getting support. You know, it's self-care. It's, you know, I'm not living in denial of cancer. I'm, I'm, I'm welcoming it. You know, I was embracing it at that point. I didn't see a reason to fight it or to go into battle or war. It was like, gosh, this is here for a reason. And maybe it's here for me. 
Um, yeah. So I'm going to open myself up to it as see it as a teacher, as a guide, you know, that might be here to, to show me an even better life. And that, I love again, that. that perspective isn't for everyone. You know, the, the fight, the battle, some people love it. I have a firefighter girlfriend who just, that was, yeah, that's how her mind works. She's like, no, you go in, you you burn around the edges, you dose it with the chemo poison, you know, like that's her mindset and it works for her. I'm like, awesome, perfect. And I want people to know too, that I never had to fight cancer for a single moment to become free yeah. from it. And when I say free from it, it is not a physical diagnosis is cancer free for me? It's it's a it's a mindset. It's a state of mind because I found many points in the cancer journey when I had cancer, I felt the freest I've ever felt in my entire life. And then there were points where cancer was done that I went down that rabbit hole again in terror and fear of a recurrence. And I, I was not cancer free, even though physically I was. So it was just so interesting to experience both both polarities of it and see, you know, my main message in, in my book is freedom from cancer is a state of mind. And you don't have to wait until you're in remission or pronounced cancer free to find it. And I found it many different times with cancer. Tell everyone the title of your book. Uh, it's called My Guru Cancer. I have it right next to me. You just released it, right? It was just I printed, did. right? I just released it actually on my birthday, <laughs> again, <laughs> five years after my diagnosis. So it's around my my can- five-year cancer anniversary, and I call it my book baby. I, I like to joke about that because I'm am infertile uh, from treatment, and so this is my this is my birth. <laughs> and it's been five mm. years of pregnancy, so it's pretty exciting. I want to ask you about that, but first I want to point to something you said, which is just so worth repeating. You lived free from cancer while cancer was in your body, as well as not being free from cancer when the cancer was out of your body and you're pointing to the state of mind and you know, reminding everyone who's listening that it wasn't just, oh, I'm excited about cancer and I'm joyful and that's how it's going to be and then the end. It's like, no, it was mm-hmm. up and down and back and forth, but it was mm-hmm. you continually returned to that state of mind, to that created state of mind. Like I always envision it as a sailboat for anyone who sailed into the wind you have to tack back and forth. You're going to a certain direction, but you can't, it's, it's, you, you get on that line of that direction and then you get past it and you get back to it and you get past it and it's intentional, but it's all about returning to that place. Mm-hmm. And I share with you that experience in that when I first was diagnosed, cancer for me was like being lost in a maze. And I'm like, which direction do I go? What if I make the wrong choice? Like mm-hmm. I could die. Mm-hmm. That's when I realized for me, and again, for everyone listening, this is not for you. This is my experience and I honor every experience everyone has. And what got me through my diagnosis and what lifted me up and inspired me personally was when I saw, oh, whether I live or die is a distraction because I want to live my life fully no matter what's happening in my life. Why? Because I hadn't been for so many years. It's like, if I'm going to die, holy cow, I haven't been living my life fully for so long. I'm going to live the fullest expression of me right now, as true as I know how to. And if I die, that's the path I'm going down. And yeah, I'm going to do everything I can to not die. Yeah. But I'm not going to miss my life if this is the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, 100%. So I love that you said that. It's, it's, it's uh, for those who it resonates with, it's just another... Mm-hmm inspiring example of one way you can navigate a diagnosis and like you said so beautifully there's one part of that process of the work that i just want to circle back to so like we walk through those four questions is it true can you absolutely know it's true how do you react when you believe the thought and then who would you be without the thought and then the last part of the part of the work is it's called the turnarounds so you're taking a thought and you're flipping it to different opposites and seeing if it could also be true. So if I'm working the thought, my life is over, you know, I could flip it to my life is beginning or my life isn't over. It would be two opposites. And, and then you find examples. So those turnarounds kind of sound like a positive affirmation, you know, on its own. But it's so much, it's so much more than that because then you have to find proof. Okay, my life is beginning. How could that be true? You know, what are some examples? And 
know, I found it for sure within my work and career. It was like this brand new direction of working with clients and, and people and, you know, and bodies and, and that relationship between the mind and body. It was like a whole nother experience of it. So my life is beginning. And then, you know, what you just shared, I discovered early on and, and over and over again, like life is precious and oh my gosh, live it now. Like nobody's guaranteed tomorrow. We hear this all the time, but when you're faced with mortality in your thirties, it's quite a different lesson where you're like, yeah, I'm going to drop this stupid petty, (laughs) you know, things that I, you know, stress over every day and, and really focus on, on cultivating the life that I want. And so my, my life is beginning. And so I would, you know, just sit in that, how else could it be true? How else could it be true? And finding that proof was um, just another way of opening my mind to all possibilities, you know, not just that worst case, scary, scary scenario, all of it. And so that's where like, you know, people are often saying, I'm sure you heard it too. Like you need to stay positive and you know, like stress hmm. creates more cancer, which is even more <laughs> stressful. That's such a stressful stress. thing to think about. You are going to have stress and cancer, but hearing that, you know, it's like, Oh, just be positive. Well, this, this process like put me in a genuine state of positivity, you know, not like, Oh, okay. I'm just gonna be positive. It's all gonna be great. It's all gonna be great. But inside, I'm like dying. You know, <laughs> like it's a very clear how to live in a genuine state of feeling positive, inspired, grateful. You know, for what I'm going through. And like you said, I oh my gosh, ongoing practice over and over and over again throughout so many yeah. challenges. It was in no means I did the work once, and it was like. Do a fairy going through it. It was a practice, yeah. <laughs> and and worth it. You know, so yeah. so worth it. Yeah, definitely something worth giving your attention to. You mentioned the turnarounds, mm-hmm. and can you give an example of how that worked for you when you were working on a belief or a thought yeah. that was disempowering you? Yeah. So, you know, that one example, my life is over. My life is beginning. You know, it's not over is a way of um, turning it around. Another belief, you know, I looked at and you may, I don't know if you felt the same way was that my body betrayed me, you know, like here, here I am like, you know, living a pretty good life and I feed it well. And, you know, there's no genetic history of cancer in my family. And, you know, I know this person who like, eats fast food 20 times a day and they don't have cancer. What the heck? You know, there's this gosh body, like, you know, what are you doing here? And then that whole, I mean, the cancer is growing, you know, so my body's betraying me was, was a thought that I worked at one point, you know, my body all of a sudden became this hostile, like scary land and unpredictable. And it did not feel like it was on my side, you know, at first. Mm -hmm. So, so walking, myself through those four questions, you know, with, with that belief, my body betrayed me and seeing just how painful it was to see it that way. You know, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not, but like, ouch, I I'm in this vehicle. Like I cannot, (laughs) we for life, like lifetime partners here, no matter what, (laughs) no matter how long that life is, but to see it as this enemy just brought even more stress to, to an already challenging situation. So so stepping out of that belief and, and dropping it for a moment and just seeing how it felt, you know, to, to drop the belief that my body betrayed me, it just, I got to see like, wow, this thing is really working hard for me here. Like, it's like the heart's still beating, my lungs are breathing, I can walk, I can move, I can sleep, I can eat, I show up to treatment, like it's handling treatment pretty well, like it's, I am became grateful you know, in that space. So then it moves to the turnarounds. My body betrayed me. It didn't betray me. So that would be flipping it to the opposite. And so, you know, I noticed like my, my body grew these lumps, you know, sometimes cancer, you can't feel the lumps, but my body grew some lumps for me to feel. I, I chose to ignore it. (laughs) That was on me, that part. And I don't use that as like bashing myself. I use it as, as education, like feel a lump, get it checked out, done simple as that you know I'm grateful it showed me the lumps otherwise I wouldn't have known and then my body didn't betray me like it's it's with me it's 
breathing for me. It's, it's trying to heal the cancer, you know, in conjunction with medications and the acupuncture and the food, like it's taking it all in. And, and I would see tumors shrinking, you know, with the chemotherapy, which was so exciting. Um, so my body isn't betraying me, you know, it's, it's here with me. What would, what would be the opposite for you of betray? Like if you had to pick a word. I would pick the word. What comes to mind is supporting me. Mm -hmm. So my body's supporting me, you know, could be another little way to, to look at it. And, oh my gosh, we could find that just right here, right now. It's, you know, we're seated. It has a voice <laughs> so we can communicate. <laughs> I'm sipping coffee. It's delicious. <laughs> um, and just, you know, when you check in with all the ways our bodies are working for us all the time, like 24 seven, even when we're sleeping, um, it puts me in, in this state of gratitude for this vehicle instead of, you know, seeing it as an enemy. So another turnaround that's kind of interesting is you can often, if you're judging an object like the body or cancer, you can change my body to my thinking about my body. And so the turnaround becomes my thinking about my body betrayed me. And then I look at like, okay, what's truer? Did my actual body betray me? Or is it what I'm thinking and believing yeah. that has the betrayal in this moment? And that's, you know, where I saw so much more truth. It was like, oh my gosh, no, like my, it's what I'm thinking and believing. And, and again, there's that, where does that future live where we're dying in a hospital bed with gray skin and 80 pounds, like hmm. in our head, that's our thinking betraying yeah. us, you know, painting these, these imaginary, it's, they're movies, you know, and they're not a problem. These movies aren't a problem at all, unless we believe them unless we believe that they are true or will come true. That's, that's the problem. This work is the solution. Like I, I can have whatever thought I want. And honestly, I'm pretty entertained by my thoughts now. Mm -hmm. Like they, they still go to these crazy places. I had a pain in my toe recently and I'm like, the tumor's back in my toes. And like, you know, it's just <laughs> what the mind does. There you go. Yeah. So, and it's just so refreshing to know that you don't have to believe everything you think, you know, and you can take that pause, step back and, and catch those thoughts, you know, as they arise before going down the rabbit hole. It's, it's possible, which I have. And I also just sometimes go down that rabbit hole again. Yeah. And that's so important for people yeah. to hear it. Going down the rabbit hole is part of life. It's not that yeah. you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Very easy to think, oh my gosh, I'm going to have cancer. When I went to my last scan in you know, last December, I had, you know, because I had a recurrence in my liver, there was pain under my rib cage just above my rib liver. Every time I go every year, the nurse practitioner presses against my liver, says, take a deep breath. And uh, whatever, whatever, it's always the same. Well, this time it hurt. And in the 10 minutes that she walked out and my doctor walked in for the final meeting, I had mapped out how I was going to work every other week in, you know, coordination with the chemotherapy, how I was going to tell the kids, how I was going to tell my family. And then my doc walks in and says, hey, you're fine. <laughs> we, the, the thinking isn't, there's not, the, the thinking is not the issue because that's never going away as far as I can tell. Nope, <laughs> never. <laughs> But my response to it is getting yeah. more and more dialed in to, yeah. oh, you again. Oh, you are, you're here to joyfully tell me that I'm going to die. Got it. Thank you. You had me for like five minutes. <laughs> and I totally went down the rabbit hole. And because I have myself in such a practice of not staying in that rabbit hole, I'm able to get, okay, that was a thought and it's likely not real. And there's a possibility of it, but there's a million possibilities. You know, yeah. the more we go and work with practitioners, the more we learn about parts of our body. We're like, really? That's what's doing that? I would have never thought of that. Like, bingo. <laughs> and you didn't. You thought you were dying. Yes. <laughs> I think it's amazing. Pain is such a great teacher, period. But it it's so fascinating when you first feel a new pain or a new sensation, just all the stories that we put on it immediately. So yeah, if you've been through cancer, like number one top news story is cancer's back with any new pain. And I, and I see that with all the clients I work with too. Like we're not alone in this <laughs> experience. Everyone, everyone goes through it. So yeah, there's that label, the story, the cancer's back. And there's also the story, you know, it'll get worse. 
it'll last forever. It'll, you know, turn into something else. You know, it'll lead to not being able to do X, Y, Z. So there is like your whole future of work being rescheduled. And it's amazing how much is born out of that moment. And when you, when you take the time to like press pause on the mind, I think it's cool. Like it's, it's really cool to see how quick those thoughts just multiply, you know, like cancer cells are like, (laughs) and then any of those can be taken to inquiry or, you know, just noticing. Like I, I'm fascinated by all that can arise from just a sensation I feel Mm. in my body, you know, and you're like, wow, amazing. Look at that mind go. (laughs) Yeah. And it could be as simple as this communication, like, Hey, pay attention to me. Will you take me to um, therapy? (laughs) Yeah. Oh, Hey, will you give me some water? Can we lie down? You know, like that could just be the simple message of the body. Can you exercise me more? Yeah. Just move me a little more. Can you take a supplement and help me out a little bit? Yeah. That's what the pain is. And it's, yeah. it's. I mean, not to step over the fact that pain can sometimes be very difficult. Oh, of course. And it is a, it's, it's a communication to the body. It is, a, it is the check engine light coming on. Mm-hmm. And it really does, if you look at, like, why you would go to, I don't know, a yoga teacher, a practitioner, a spiritual teacher, you know, you go to find presence you go to slow down, you go to, you know, get in touch with your true self, to live from an authentic place. Like it's all these, if you look at why you go to a spiritual teacher and then you look at what you can learn from pain, you know, pain brings you to the present moment. I mean, right here, right now, I, I can't go anywhere else because, whoa, I'm in this deep, intense <laughs> sensation. And then I saw how painful it was to go into past and future with pain, you know, especially the future of like, oh my God, it's going to get worse. This is going to be intolerable. I'm going to the ER. I'm going, you know, like blah, 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 future. So God, what a call to being presence is, is pain. And then slowing down and listening, you know, to ourselves on a deeper level and checking in. And when you're living in pain, you're prioritizing your life you're not going to say yes to doing shit you don't want to do because you have limited time (laughs) when you're feeling good so you really are much more in your integrity so i i like to um well you know obviously the title of the book is my guru cancer but it's really interesting to me to just look at everything in life that i feel that trigger that push from and and see it as a teacher you know what could this be teaching me takes me out of that like I need to fix it control world, which is not doesn't work well for me, nor does it ever fix it. And into this role of being a student, you know, an observer and a learner, and it's an open mind, you know, it's a much better place to live from. I agree and I find it a humbling experience to take on that state of mind because then I recognize, oh, my mind is never going to fully grasp all that is being provided me to learn from. I have to do it bit by bit. I'm going to mm-hmm. continue to drop the ball. I'm going to continue to land on my face <laughs> and just staying in a practice of not resisting that, getting that that's part of the design, and then reaping the benefits of taking and experiencing whatever lesson I am, I guess that my attention is being given to right now. Mm-hmm. That has me actually have a question for you. Mm -hmm. May I ask you about, you know, you called your book, your baby book, and about being infertile. May I ask you about that? Yeah. So it's interesting. That's a big, yeah, that's a big thing to be told that you're, you're infertile because I'm Mm -hmm. curious what treatment created the infertility. Like what was the actual process that you went through? You know, what's interesting is, you know, I say it was treatment. I never had my fertility tested before cancer. So it is possible that for all I know, Mm. I was always infertile. But for me, just, you know, I was married at the time. And like, we talked about kids and went back and forth a lot. We kind of landed in a no. We were actually helping to raise our godson, who at the time I was diagnosed, he was 11. And so, I don't know, I just felt, felt fulfilled in that area. And so when I was first having the doctor's appointments to handle the treatment plan, I was asked, you know, do you plan to have children? And I said, no. And 
And the oncologist said, good, because you likely won't be able to after treatment, which is the chemotherapy. And she said, and there's not enough time to harvest your eggs. And at that moment, what was fascinating was I was actually, I felt relief in that moment because the decision was over. Mm. Like I didn't have to go back and forth and wonder. So that was actually shockingly, much to my surprise, good news in that moment. But then later that grief hit me and it hit really hard. You know, I ended up choosing a double mastectomy as well. And so, you know, I nursing, like breastfeeding, nursing, being pregnant, like that whole world, you know, I'll never have it. I, then I started feeling angry that that choice was, was taken away. So it was interesting that, Mm -hmm. you know, my first reaction was relief and then later, you know, just pain. And it wasn't, I know there's so many ways to have children and, you know, my godson, I, I really do see as a son in my life. And so it doesn't have to be, you know, from blood and, and I get it. And at the same time, I really had to honor, honor the grief. So, so then what was interesting is I go through treatment, which the treatment plan was six months of aggressive chemo. It started that way. So we could shrink the tumors. Then I had a double mastectomy, five weeks of radiation. And then a year later I had my breast reconstructed, which technically isn't cancer treatment, but I think it still is. <laughs> in my mm. opinion. Um, so, and then uh, 10 years of hormone therapy, which I'm still on which is just taking a pill a day. So what, what, I, what I learned later then was from my oncologist was that, oh, technically like it's possible for you to get pregnant maybe, but it, if you did, it could kill you. <laughs> and I was oh like, my. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> because my, my cancer was estrogen positive, it means it feeds on estrogen. And I'm still in a young body that's making estrogen. So when you're pregnant, your hormones are like, you know, they fluctuate and it can be flooded with, with the peak of estrogen, which is like flooding your body with cancer candy. So if I were to be pregnant, it would flood the body with cancer candy. This is all what I'm told. And I wouldn't be able to take that medication, you know, that I'm currently on. And I do know there are some women that like, they really, really want to have a family and they're determined and there are ways to harvest eggs and take a different medication. And, you know, it's possible. So it, but to me, I didn't, you know, I wasn't a big enough yes to, to having my own children to, to pursue that. So I had my fertility tested then to, cause I started feeling freaked out about sex then, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, mm-hmm. this is terrifying. So that's when I had it tested. And then I was told it would take a Jesus miracle for me to get pregnant and that my fertility was like almost a zero <laughs> and whatever the amh level or something like that so yeah there's a relief there yeah you're like that was okay, then again another relief again <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah so it's really interesting and what a mind game for sure but i do feel like you know for women who you're going through this young which is its own you know in your 30s like that's not what you're supposed to be going through and i'm sure you felt a similar way it's like no that's when you grow families you grow careers you don't grow cancer like that's not yeah. in your 30s when you had said earlier, you felt like your body betrayed you. From for me, it was you know the universe had betrayed me. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. in what you're saying now, I was like, excuse me, like laying on my back the day after I was diagnosed, laying on the couch, screaming at the ceiling, no, like I am not one of these people. How the hell do I have cancer? Like you know, oh my god, I'm gonna die. The whole thing, yada yada yada. But yeah, I was young and it just it made no sense. It didn't fit inside of what I imagined my future to be and what I believed the world was and what being a human being was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was your specific diagnosis? Like it was breast cancer, but do you recall what the exact you said like you were hormone positive? Yeah, I was ER positive and then the other test, you know, PR negative, HER2 negative. So ER positive breast cancer. It's invasive ductal carcinoma is the type. It's called IDC. So it had, you know, I had a tumor. The largest tumor in my breast was about, I think, 4.2 centimeters. And then the one, the largest lymph node, I had spread to my lymph nodes. They weren't sure how many. And the largest one was 4.8 centimeters. And so that's why chemo was recommended to do first was to shrink the tumors to give me, you know, an easier surgery where Mm -hmm. they wouldn't have to take out as much tissue. And in the breast, you know, it's interesting. I, I really... I was a vote for a lumpectomy at first because I was like, less is more. I'm a natural person. Um, I, 
I don't know if you felt this way, but like I had such an inner conflict at first about Western medicine. I'd, I'd been so natural for so many years and, and really thought if I ever had a big health scare, I wouldn't use Western medicine. And so I had a lot of stress around like the war between alternative and Western medicine and, and what you read online. And it's terrifying. It was terrifying to me and confusing because on one hand you'd read like this heals cancer. And on the other hand, the next article is like, this is what causes cancer. And I'm like, Oh shit. Like what am I doing here? And I had a lot of shame too. We're working in wellness. You know, that was my job. And here mm. I am shame about getting cancer in the first place and then shame about not choosing nature fully to heal me. You know, I, I had an integrated plan where it was, you know, foods and supplements, all that was a huge part of, of my healing journey. And I still did an assload of drugs and said yes to, I mean, I had my breast removed, you know, I ended up choosing that double mastectomy and I didn't have to, you know, I had choices. And so it was so interesting to, to see that identity be kind of crushed, you know, this whole natural thing and then realize, wait, that's okay. <laughs> like medicine is also a gift and it's a privilege um, that we have it and a privilege that it's accessible to us. And, and it's not any less spiritual than, than nature. You know, that's again, another belief and mindset. And so I love the integrative path, but there was a big undoing there around the shame of, of not choosing natural nature. And I don't, I mean, did you, it sounds like you integrated a few different things. My first treatment that I took on was Gerson therapy. And for those folks who are listening, Gerson therapy is a detox therapy that is based on the premise that if you detoxify your body through diet and supplements, your body can then get rid of the cancer like most healthy bodies do. And I did 10 months of that treatment. You know, my doctor told me that I was going to have to have a colostomy. And so did my second opinion. And Daniela did a lot of research and she found Gerson therapy. And the first thing I said to her is like, ah, uh, you know, carrot juice and green juice is not going to cure me of cancer. Like this is ridiculous. Maybe I wasn't so, you know, like that, but that was my thinking. Right. And then I connected with some folks who used Gerson therapy to heal themselves from cancer. And I started to understand, oh, my goodness, like, you know, large amounts of carrot juice will actually detoxify the body to the point that it can actually make you sick because it's pulling so many toxins out. So I spoke to these folks. I looked into it. I did 10 months of Gerson therapy you know, with some folks supporting me, some folks is like practically. Is it juicing or is there some food, it's raw food incorporated? Everything is, anything that goes into your body is for medicinal purpose. Yeah. And so it's a combination of cooked and raw foods. It's Hippocrates soup. Mm -hmm. It's tons of fresh fruit and cooked vegetables. You know, no grain, no, no everything. You know, like no oil, no salt. You have to take mm -hmm. a potassium supplement because you're not taking salt. I said no grain. I was able to eat oatmeal in the morning. And, uh, and then you drink carrot juices. So it detoxifies the body, pulls the toxins out of your body. And then you drink so much carrot juice that you'll actually pull toxins out faster than your liver can extract those toxins from your blood. And so there are coffee enemas that are included. And I encourage most people to laugh when I say that. And, uh, <laughs> I've heard all about coffee enemas. Yeah. I like because to drink mine, but I've heard great things actually <laughs> about the other way too. <laughs> had some friends make some great jokes with me, at me, for me. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, the coffee speeds up the rate at which the liver expels bile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so without the coffee enemas, you would just have the carrot juice pull tons of toxins out of your body. And then your liver wouldn't be able to pull it out of the blood and process it. And so it just you'd just be making yourself sick from all the toxins being pulled out. And then they just go right back into your body. And if you drank the coffee, there's you know, quote, you know, toxins in the coffee that then your body would just be processing. You'd be undoing everything that you're doing. And as you can imagine, you know, the large intestine, it does not allow toxins in the body, right? That's the bowel, right? So it's certainly not absorbing any toxins, but the caffeine travels from the large intestine through the portal veins to the liver and speeds up the rate at which the liver expels bile. And then the green juice is to feed the liver. 
and you take supplements and uh, I did that for 10 months because I did not want to have a colostomy. Mm -hmm. And after 10 months, Daniela sat with me and said, Bert, you're doing like five coffee enemas a day. And there are people listening right now. And I know you're like, excuse me, that's <laughs> what were you doing? What was I doing? I did a lot of research and I, just, I, I, oh still, had, I still had blood work. Mm -hmm. I had quarterly CT scans because I sure as heck wasn't going to walk into a holistic approach and, you know, blind. And so they kept monitoring it, like the tumor is not growing. The cancer is not going anywhere. Okay, we'll keep trying it. The mm -hmm. tumor is not growing. The cancer is not going anywhere. Okay, we'll keep trying it. But I was on morphine for pain because the rectal cancer had grown into, well, it grown into the, the sphincter, the anus, and uh, there was pain there. After 10 months, Daniela sat down with me and said, like, you know, Bert, you're doing these enemas, and every time you do one, you spend 45 minutes breathing through the pain until you're you know, relatively comfortable. And this is on the large amount of morphine you're on. She's like, like I'm watching you do this. And it's like, it's, I, I think we're at a breaking point here, you know? So after getting some additional opinions, I came to terms with the fact that this therapy was not going to cure me of cancer. And so I went to get multiple opinions, you know, from allopathic doctors from traditional medicine mm -hmm. and determine which way I wanted to go. And there's a huge amount of shame because mm -hmm. I had a blog that I originally used just to tell people what was going on for me. Mm -hmm. And then I used it to tell them what was going on for me emotionally. Mm -hmm. And on a side note, that became this whole extraordinary experience of like, okay, what do I not want to tell you today? Mm -hmm. What am I ashamed of? What am I hiding from yeah. all of you? You know, and that became a daily practice for me. You know, my mantra when I was going through it was, so today I'm giving up that my treatment would look a certain way and I'm actually being with what's so. Mm -hmm. And that was a daily practice for me. So on my blog, getting back to that, I ended up having this huge following from, you know, all over the world. It was a public blog, you know, every, on every continent that has human beings, people were following me and commenting and watching my progress with Gerson therapy. So I felt this great you know, responsibility and I was super excited to be someone who was going to heal his body of cancer through Gerson therapy. And when that didn't work, there was all this shame about like I've, I failed myself, I failed people. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of, there was a big process involved in just was there getting. Also, like I did something wrong? Like I yes. Did oh yeah. Right I did. Yeah, because yeah. M the doctor that I, saw at the clinic in Mexico, he had me on a, uh, it wasn't on the full therapy. It was uh, on a partial therapy because I had rectal cancer and that's an exposed tumor. Any thing moving, any food moving through your body and being processed, it, it, it literally comes into contact with the tumor. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel good. And with the coffee enemas and I had rectal cancer, it caused a lot of discomfort. Yeah. You know, and I had this, you know, I should have just done the full therapy. You know, there are ways to do it and I shouldn't have done a moderate therapy and you know just all of that and and the disappointment of having to do traditional medicine traditional treatment the disappointment of not fulfilling on this what I did wrong you know the whole thing and it was incredibly freeing when I got dude you went for it and you used CT scans and blood work and you monitored it and you didn't let it get carried away and when the pain became too much you went on to another treatment. You know, I had this vision of me being somebody who was going to, like, I was going to write a book. There's going to be this whole thing about natural treatments. Mm -hmm. And in the natural treatment conversation, there's all this talk about how horrible Western traditional medicine is and just, like, you know, the horrors of it all and how these hospitals, you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering is this terrible organization. Like, I went to Memorial Sloan Kettering for my metastasis when it metastasized my liver, and I've never worked with such an extraordinary and wonderful group of people. I recommend Memorial Sloan Kettering to anybody who has the ability to get there. You know, it's just, there's a lot of stories in, in, in traditional medicine about how holistic treatments are, are quackery Quackery. and it's horrible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there are, what are these, they say, charlatans? Yeah, there's probably lots, I'm sure there's lots of charlatans out there who will take all your money and let you die. Like, I mean, I'm not advocating to anyone to even do. No, but it's not to just be written off. The holistic either. treatment, right. But mm -hmm. it had me curious. Danielle and I looked into it, and so I did it. And, yeah, and then ultimately I did standard protocol for rectal cancer. I had five and a half weeks of chemo and radiation. I had surgery, 
and then I had six months of post-surgery chemotherapy. And interestingly, when we met with my oncologist before he prescribed the six months of chemo, even after my surgery, he said that when he looked at the pathology report, they said there wasn't a single living cell of cancer in the whole tumor. He said he'd never seen that before. There's always some cancer. And, you know, my belief is that I detoxified my body to the point that the cancer was weakened significantly. And then when they went in there and gave me chemotherapy and radiation, they crushed it. It didn't have a yeah. chance. So, you know, and then my father-in-law said to me before he passed, he said, you know, well, you know, he knew that you can, anyone who knows me knows you can pretty much ask me anything. And if I don't like the question, I won't answer it, but I'll likely answer it. And he said, do you think that doing the Gerson therapy may have caused the metastasis? Because what happened is some cancer cells traveled from my large intestine through the portal veins to my liver. It didn't go through my lymph nodes. I'm very mm -hmm. grateful for that. He said, do you think it's possible that the Gerson therapy uh, caused that? And I thought about it for a bit and said, yeah, it's definitely possible. And that's just what's so. Like, this is my life. And if my life is to include all the choices I made up until now and then I pass away as a result of it, then that's the life that I'm living, you know? I'm not gonna get stuck in, did I make the right choice? Because as I was telling you earlier, when I was first diagnosed, I had the experience of being in a maze, and I didn't know if I was gonna make the right choice or not. And the part I left out earlier is that what shifted for me was after about 30 days, it suddenly struck me. This thought just landed in my mind that this cancer is a gift, and whether I live or die is irrelevant, because what there is to do when you're alive is to live. And that's when the maze disappeared and I realized I was in a labyrinth. And the only thing to do in a labyrinth is to walk forward. Mm -hmm. there are, you have no choice. You just simply go down the path you're on. And sure, there were times that I would just, you know, drop to my knees crying, praying that I didn't die as I'm looking at the kids, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I would return to, this is my path. And this is the only one I have and I can't, you know, I can argue with how my path is going and where my path seems to be going, but that's not going to change it. Mm. What's so it's is so just harder. what's so. <laughs> it <laughs> it just so makes it more harder. difficult. And your imagination, yeah. as you said, the stories you make up. I, you know, I see medicine going in this direction, which is exciting. Just this, this land of learning from both sides of, of you know, to me, I, I feel like the juicing I did, and I was mostly on a vegan diet, I ended up adding fish and eggs back in because I was just losing so much weight so quickly. Yeah. But the way that I ate and the supplements and the acupuncture and of course this this mind body practice that I was doing and yoga, like I think it really supported me with side effects in treatment and, and you know, my body like just keeping it as healthy as possible so it can handle, you know, all the treatment even better. Um, I didn't have the kind of side effects that you know, I had heard about, it was hard, of course, but I knew like chemo is not a time to be doing a lot, guys. It's time to yeah. do, do less, be, so, you know, don't expect to live the same pace of life. Don't, you know, expect your body to be full of energy. It's, it's a tired time. Um, what kind of side effects did you have? You know, fatigue for sure. I was the most tired I've, I've ever been. Um, I love naps, so I just got really good at taking them and sometimes <laughs> would take like five in one day. So definitely fatigue, weakness, you know, in my muscles and joints. And then a funny side effect that actually leads to the cover of my book, as you can see this painting behind me, Yeah, was hemorrhoids. <laughs> and that's, I didn't know, I don't know. I feel funny complaining about hemorrhoids to you because you dealt with way more butt issues than I did in cancer. <laughs> But they were a pain in my ass. Like literally, yeah. they were really painful. And yeah. um, that was that showed up in the beginning of treatment in chemo. And there was one day where I was just pissed. Like I was just like enough. I'm pissed. I just went out of this and my butt hurts. <laughs> and so I went for a walk or more like waddled on a walk in, in a little park near near my my place in Dallas, which is where I was living in treatment. And I I sat down on a bench. And I looked out at the trees in front of me and, you know, again, I'm like, I'm pissy and I'm in a bad mood. And I look at the trees and there's a big hole, like right in the middle of them. And I look at it and I just immediately think of a butthole because I'm like, 
<laughs> obviously it's on my mind. I'm like, there's a butthole in the middle of the trees. Are you kidding me? And then I just bursted out laughing. <laughs> so I was like, okay, universe, like I get it. Like it's just this big joke. <laughs> Whatever's on your mind, you're going to see out there. So here I am, butthole in the tree. I take a photo of it and it's actually what is the tree in this painting and the hole, which looks like some spiritual like center of it's a butthole <laughs> is actually the center of the painting. Um, so it actually was the only painting I did in cancer too. I used to paint all the time, but I just, I did one and it ended up being like the perfect cover. <laughs> for the it's book. beautiful. But I, it's it really beautiful. By hemorrhoids. <laughs> That's, I love that. I love I know. that. And I'll I knew tell I you had what. to tell that story on, on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we on the but seriously podcast of course. yeah <laughs> when i had so much pain in the tumor which was in the you know grown into the sphincter muscle i had no idea how much the anus how much the butthole is the center of the body like you have no idea like when you when that's when that is a tumor in it every mm -hmm. time you you turn your body, you lean, you pick something up, you sneeze, you, yeah. you, you stretch. I mean, it is amazing how often that muscle is triggered. So it's actually kind of perfect from my experience that that is like the roots of uh, your area of awareness, of, your, of the awareness rising within you. Because believe you me, you cannot imagine how much the butthole is the root of so much of what we do is involved regardless and i feel like that's your book title in some way the butthole is the center of the universe or i don't know something, <laughs> <laughs> something. there's something here bert i don't know i was thinking the the, the the uh the uh, title of my book would be from a maze to a labyrinth but maybe it should be the butthole is the center of the universe <laughs> butthole and then call it the center of the universe yeah, when i was on your okay. website when you said you want to be in the podcast, I hopped on yeah. your website and I was just you know, reviewing the different parts you had and you had a yoga practice you were providing on there and an exercise and, you're, and, and you said, yep, this is providing you a great butt shot. And I was just like, okay, she's going to be fun on my podcast because she's teaching on her website and she's making butt jokes. <laughs> yep. I oh found a great match. I can joke about cancer endlessly. <laughs> um, and it's helpful. I mean, it really is like bringing humor to any crazy shit going on in life is like, it's such medicine in my opinion. I mean, they're like, I, you know, I have these new boobs now, which look like great in a tank top and clothes on. You just, you wouldn't even know they're fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, clothes off. They're weird as fuck. Like they, yeah. they, I have implants and they're underneath my pec muscle. And I, mind you, my originals were amazing. I had like God's gift. I don't know Did what you? happened, but it just was that way. So it was my favorite body part, you know, that was getting replaced. Um, mm, and so that in itself was was really tough. And I know it was tough on my partner, too, because it's also his favorite body part. But I just, you know, it gave me more peace of mind. I, I knew I knew I didn't know if I'd have cancer again, but I knew I would have lumps again because my, my breasts were just naturally really lumpy. You know, they called it fibrocystic breast disease or just lumpy boobs. So I knew I would have to, you know, continue to be monitored and go through that whole process of mammogram ultrasound biopsy. So anyways, when I, I chose the double mastectomy and there's a lot of different ways breasts are rebuilt these days, I didn't have enough fat in my body to, to build uh, breasts with it. So often like there's belly fat that's used or you know, other things I had, I call it skinny bitch problems. Like I, you know, I also <laughs> lost so much weight in chemo too. I was already tiny, but I was like, one oh my gosh, eight. I gained weight in chemo. I ate Did so you? much. The nausea would go away when I would eat. So I would stuff myself. <laughs> I ate a ton too. And it just, I don't know, it would not stick. I look like a little, yeah, bald alien, but so mm. I have implants and then also they, they liposuctioned a little bit of fat from my love handles, which I had to grow, uh, after surgery, I, or before surgery, I um, would eat ice cream. Like so you were farming every night. love handles. <laughs> so my boobs are made of my love handles and then implants. But because they're under the pec muscle, like when I flex them a certain way, you know, imagine your flex muscle tightens in. Well, it contorts and twists your boob. It looks like an inverted squash raisin like when I flex it. And that wasn't in the brochure. You know, inverted when Inverted squashed raisin. That's not a selling point. No, it is not. And it's like, of course, 
when, you know, you're fuck, I'm either doing yoga practice or it's during sex. And it's like right there. I mean, it was, it was so hard to do with at first. And yeah. then I'm like, I just got to laugh at this because there's no other way around it. And, and so now I'm just like, yeah, they do weird party tricks. And there's a new <laughs> one I found out about recently that I didn't know. I was at this, I was at this little cancer camp with some young cancer survivors like myself. And it's actually an organization called First Descents, who I absolutely love. There's a whole chapter about them in my book. But they do these big free adventure trips for young cancer survivors. What are they called? Uh, First Descents. First Descents. Is that their website? Yeah, firstdescents.org. They're amazing. I I volunteer with them now. I I could not speak highly enough about, about both what they do and then the community they create. I've met so many cool people through it. So I'm on a rock climbing trip and there's another girl who is a breast cancer survivor as well. And, and she, and she had implants and she asked me, she goes, so have you lit yours up yet? And I'm like, I'm sorry, are, are yours flammable? Like what, what are you talking about? And then she grabs my hand and uh, pulls me into the bathroom, turns the lights off and she takes her iPhone, turns the flashlight on and puts the flashlight up to her breasts. And the whole thing glows like a pink, bright glow ball. No way. And I was like, what (laughs) does mine do this? And so I had had them for two years. No idea. And sure enough, I have two glow ball boobs that I had no idea about. And I'm like, why aren't they telling you this? This is a a cell for surgery, right? That's part of your costume at a rave. Of course. Like, I wasn't going to go to Burning Man before, but I might have to now (laughs) because I would have two glow boobs. So, yeah, just, again, finding the, using the weird, the weird parts, uh, making fun of them. And then that's just, you know, that's the body now. (laughs) <laughs> so first of all, it's super sweet that you actually got to grow some fat on your body to get yeah. your boobs. That's wonderful. The oh, question and I have... some of that fat died, though, in my boob. Mm. <laughs> I found some lumps later, uh, which, of course, you know, post-treatment, new lump in breast, uh-oh, and go to the doctor. And she does the ultrasound. She's like, oh, it's fat necrosis. It's fat that didn't take during the surgery. So I'm like, oh, so it's my dead love candles that are just sitting in my boobs right now. She's like... Yeah, basically. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Do we remove necrotic yeah. tissue or? We just no. it. She's like, does it bother you? I'm like, I guess not. <laughs> Part of me is dead in me. No, that's fine. Just don't uh, love him the whole fat. Oh my uh, goodness. So and, and so <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. the, the other question I have is, is it standard to put the implant behind the muscle or is that for you so that is standard but there's a lot of new new techniques coming out of putting them over the pec muscle it wasn't something my surgeon recommended for me and i'm learning you know as the years have passed it's been three years since i had that surgery there's been more advancements so they are now doing more of the implants over the pec muscle and then they'll use something called alloderm or skin grafting t- that goes over that kind of holds it holds it in place. So right now the pec muscle, you know, does a good job of holding the breast implant in place. So allograft, I think, is funny because it I had to sign off on the surgery of I might possibly need a little bit of it, so I had to sign off on on having it. But what it is is actually donor tissue that is processed, like all the DNA is taken out. But it's it's mm. yeah, fat from dead people, <laughs> and so. Fat, fat from dead people. Yeah, to sign off on, yeah, fat from dead people holding my boobs up. Mm. Um, I don't have it, but it's, I think, commonly used in the over the pec muscle surgery. But it does give a more natural look. I have one friend who I've seen, and yeah, it's like, it looks so much more natural. But over time, you know, it's, what I'm told is it, you know, doesn't hold as well. So I don't know. I think there's still, there's so many different ways to do that surgery now. I, yeah. I think it's really interesting. I could use the work right now. Yeah. As far as like just imagining dead person parts <laughs> in me, yeah. like I would need to do some Byron Katie work and be like, okay, I need to hire you and be like, okay, I need some coaching because like I'm just freaking out. My imagination's going bananas. I mean, I have, I know there's someone in my life who has like a, someone in my life who has like a, what, what's the kind way of saying a dead person's 
bone in them or yeah. something. Yeah. I don't know what the it proper. It happens a lot, actually. I think like yeah. you know Achilles tendon, like I, I, it happens a lot. And yeah. it's wonderful, but the mind it's sure amazing. gets creative. Oh, the mind will creative. get creative. Oh, and the mind too, like, and I'm, you know, just having breast implants, people would call a double mastectomy, like this barbaric procedure, chopping women's breasts off. And then you have, you know, bionic body parts that you're forced to live with for the rest of your life. And, you know, I had heard all these, it sound, make it sound really terrible, but in reality, it's, you know, I had some some tissue replaced my breast tissue and I've never even felt my breast tissue. I've just felt the skin. So I have tissue that's being replaced with something that's less likely to get cancer and done. That's mm. what that surgery is. And it's not, I'm not losing my breast. I have still have breasts. They're just made of a different material. And if I had some dead person body parts in there too, it's just part of the construct of my beautiful new breasts <laughs> so you, you know i would look at it you know i joke about the dead people thing and it's not really <laughs> what that is an issue is just silliness <laughs> so is there only human tissue in your breast imp that make up your breast implants no they're made of silicone you have the silicone as well because mm -hmm. yeah, i they're have called gummy bears actually <laughs> gummy bears it's so there's silicone and, and you can choose silicone or saline. So saline is just salt water. And, and of course, you know, that's the more natural choice. And again, I found myself choosing the less natural one, which I chose it because they can last longer, like up to 20 mm -hmm. years and saline needs to be replaced usually around 10 years. And then they're made of the same outer shell. So when I look at what's going in my body, like it's the, actually the same material going in. It's just what's inside. And if saline springs a leak, it's like your boob just deflates and it's gone and you need to go get another surgery. But if there's a leak in these gummy implants, they call them gummy bear because, you know, if you slice a gummy bear in half, like it doesn't ooze out mm. or anything. So supposedly, and I say supposedly because I know maybe it does leak a bit, but that was the initial problem with silicone the really liquidy kind is it would leak and it'd be toxic in your body if you did have a, a leak. But supposedly these are more leak proof and they felt a little bit more natural hmm. as well. Um, All right. there, yeah, again, like a million different ways to do that surgery now. Yeah, I have had a couple of guests who had implants and or more than a number of guests who had breast cancer and had implants. Two of them got sick from the implants mm -hmm. and had them removed, had explants. Mm -hmm. One of them told me you have to get them like scanned every so often, every so many years. Is that accurate? Yeah. Did I under understand that correctly? Yeah. And, and then they, so they can monitor to make sure there aren't any leaks or anything. Every few years? Yeah. I haven't had that done yet, so I don't know when it happens. I am mm. three years out of that surgery. So that's okay, so a good question for my doctor. <laughs> Yeah, when, yeah. When do these get scanned next? How far out after the surgery were your breasts, were your breast implants, you know, created, installed? Uh, oh, so that <laughs> that was three years ago. I call it my boobiversary. It was on um, May fourth. May the fourth be with you. So I always nice. celebrate it. So I just passed my three year. Did I? Yeah, my three year boobiversary was this past May. I love it. And that to me was like the end of, you know, mark the end of treatment for me. Yeah. I know technically that's not like removing cancer, but it was still a really big, big process. And the liposuction part, ironically, was the most painful part of that surgery. Is that right? It looked like a horse kicked my back. Like the insertions, the mm. scars are nothing. You can't see anything scarring wise. It, oh my God, I had to wear a girdle. Like that it just reminded me if someone ever really gets like major liposuction, I'm like, oh my God, I can't even imagine this, this level of pain, which, yeah, I don't, didn't really feel much in the, the boob area. No, I didn't love them at first. That's for sure. I was so excited to have them. So women, when they have this reconstruction surgery, but first, you know, it's two separate surgeries. It's the double mastectomy and then reconstructions usually later in most cases. So during the mastectomy, what they do is they put tissue expanders in. And so they're just these temporary breasts and they are very firm, like rock solid, hard little expanders. 
and they go mm. underneath the pec muscles. So my pec muscles used to being, you know, flat. Now it has this thing underneath it, pushing it up and forward. And then you go through this process of boob fills. So every week your, your breast literally gets filled with saline and, and it grows like a half of a cup size until you get a little bigger than your desired size. And that process was crazy and hilarious to watch because you're literally like looking down and you watch your boob grow. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was also really painful. Um, and oh, I don't really? know if it's, it's not painful for everyone. I don't know if just because I have a tinier body, but like as, as it would grow, it would pull the pec muscle forward. And then my whole shoulder girdle, like I would just have so much pain where mm. I did have to go back to, to pain medication for a bit around that time. But the reason that they have these temporary implants is because when the skin goes through radiation, it can often shrink your skin and those temporary implants can kind of hold the skin in place more and and stretch it so that you have a better cosmetic outcome, you know, later once you get them swapped out with, with your final reconstruction boobs. But the tissue expanders are also hilarious. Like I, they're boobs of steel. They don't move. Like I would hug people and they would think, oh my gosh, am I hurting you? Because they feel these two like <laughs> bionic mm. metal things like shoving into their chest. And I was like, no, I'm good, but I'm probably hurting you. Like I'm, wow. you're the one that's getting <laughs> these porn objects shoved into you. It was nice to like remember that they're not temporary. And and that did create like the final ones are so much better. I remember that they are temporary. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, remember that they are temporary and the final ones are, you know, much more softer. They move and yeah. and still have this like anti-gravity perk, which is pretty <laughs> cool. And how long do you have the, the, I apologize for not remembering the name, the prep boobs, the pre-boob I implants? I had them for almost a year. Really stretching the skin over time, getting yeah. your body ready to have implants. And then radiation, so you go through it, but it it's, can still affect your skin later. And it did for me. Like, it pulled my nipple in a very weird googly eye direction now to the left that, you know, and I had to do all these, like, boob pressing, stretching, massage exercises to kind of keep my, my boob down because it kept pulling it up. So... The, the thought process is radiation, like gives enough time for radiation to like have all of its effects and then, and then go in. But I still, I still dealt with, with issues after that final surgery. There are some surgeons that'll do it in two months, you know, later. I, so it's all different. I find that interesting. But yeah, my, my plastic surgeon waited a lot of extra time for that. Yeah. And you were able to keep your nipples. I was, yes. Yeah. I, you go in, you know, my, my original cancer was very far away from the nipples. So I was a candidate for what they call nipple sparing mastectomy, but they still always test the tissue right underneath the nipple when you're in the surgery, just to make sure that it's cancer free and clean. So I knew I could wake up with or without them. And I was grateful that, that I was able to keep them. And then the scars are kind of below my breast, So you don't, you don't really see them as well or as much. Mm. Yeah. And I do have to say, like, I know women that weren't able to keep the nipples and I know that that, you know, would take some time to, to make peace with, but, you know, having able to keep my nipples, they're permanently hard, permanently. Mm. So I had this whole vision of like never wearing a bra again in my life, but they're permanently hard and very much googly eyed in weird directions. So I do have to manage that now where I realize I'm like, gosh, if you don't have nipples, you don't need to worry about that. Hmm. And then you get them tattooed on straight, <laughs> looking <laughs> in the same direction. Otherwise you're wearing a shirt so and they're be... they're poking in two different yeah. directions. And it's something like I obviously have like eagle eyes for it. I don't think other people would notice mm-hmm. as much. Right, but right. it's of course like the first thing that I land on. I remember right when I finished treatment, I linked up with this amazing nonprofit organization called Cancer Round that bring, has an online platform that brings the work of Byron Katie to cancer patients. And they mm. do some other stuff that like really cool meditations and, and stuff on their website, but they didn't have yoga yet. So I met the founders at a Byron Katie event and I was like, dude, like, first of all, this is amazing because you're these are all the things I'm doing to support myself and you've made an app for it, you know, that can get out there to like 
anyone in the world, which is phenomenal. I'm like, and you're missing yoga. So I, I filmed yoga classes for their website and it was right when I finished treatment. And I, I just remember when I first looked at the video, all I could see were my uneven boobs. <laughs> mm-hmm. It was like, yeah. not, oh, wow, you're doing a really beautiful thing to help people. And this can be great. <laughs> it's like, no. Oh my God. And so again, it's what your mind focuses on. It's what your mind focuses on. I have a your distress. <laughs> permanent colostomy and I wear a pouch. Yeah. What is that and- like? It's well, the first thing I'll say is in response to what you're saying about it looking odd, like Mm -hmm. I wear, I tend to wear button down shirts. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because t shirts tend to reveal this thing pushing, you know, poking out of my abdomen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't mind anyone knowing I have a colostomy. I will go to the beach and swim and not worry about my pouch just flabbing in the wind. How big is it? Like hold up with your hands. The like pouch. Your wallet or the like pouch your... is like that. The pouch is like mm-hmm. two wallets side by side for those okay. who are listening. It goes it hangs the long way in case something, you know, exits your intestine to fill in there. And it's in the front. It's in the front. It's right under my rib cage on the left. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it gets placed, the doctor has you bend with your shirt off so they can see where the folds are in your mm-hmm. skin. And then they pick a place where there, where there isn't a fold. And I asked him if he could put it low as possible. He said, well, with, with the amount of your rectum that we're going to be, and large intestine that we're going to be removing, we have to pick this area. And we can't go down here. So we're going to go up there. So it's, it's right under my rib cage. And you mm-hmm. know, they have to stay within certain margins and cut a certain amount. So they cut to that amount. And then he had the area on my abdomen marked. And... They cut a hole in the skin and whatever else is under there, and they spread the muscles apart, and they pull the large intestine out, and they pull it through, and then fold it over like if you like, you, like you roll up your cuffs on your pants and your jeans, and then they stitch it in. So then your large intestine is just a permanent wow. hernia that pokes out of your abdomen. Jeez. Yeah, and then a wax ring goes around that, and attached to the wax ring is like a band-aid material and a piece of Tupperware. I wear a two-piece pouch. Some people wear a one-piece. And that way I can take the pouch off and with a Tupperware snap and put a new one back on. And it's just part of my life. So when you go to the bathroom, like, do you, like, are you consciously like, I'm going to the bathroom or does it just happen? So it's a great question. And I know it's like TMI questions, but I'm No, I mean, (laughs) so, so check this out. So one of my commitments inside of this podcast is to bring conversations that people don't have with each other. Because it's way too uncomfortable. And I'm hoping that someone who has a colostomy or someone who has a friend who went through cancer or a family member who has a colostomy, they're hearing me talk about it. You know, someone who's listening to you speak about breast cancer and breast replacement and all the processes, questions they wouldn't ask their friend or their family member because they don't, but they're curious. They, they want to know. They care. Or, or their mind is just curious, whatever it may be. So I love that you're asking because I want this information out there. And I, my commitment is that the conversation be your conversation. This is your podcast. And I'll chime in about parts about me when it seems appropriate. But so to answer your question, yeah, when I first got the colostomy, my bowels would just move throughout the day. And there was no making it happen. I would, I would sometimes I'd be surprised by it. Mm-hmm. And over time, I eventually could anticipate it happening. And then I still pass gas the way I always have except I don't have any control over it. Mm-hmm. And I would wear a B-band, which is a elastic material that pregnant women wear when their pants no longer fit. Mm-hmm. So they wear these bands to keep their pants on and not have just their pants just flapped open, you know, out in public or whatever, probably just walking around. It probably makes it easier to keep them on. So I bought these B-bands and would wear them. And after a year of having the colostomy and... uh I've always been a person who, like, you know, I eat three meals a day, I go to the, you know, I poop three times a day. Mm -hmm. That's how I've always been. And I wasn't blessed to be one of those once a day people that just wake up, do their thing, and move on. However, now I do something called irrigating. And I essentially give myself an enema. First thing in the morning, I go into the bathroom and I put on this, like, three foot long pouch. And I, you know, detach the Tupperware for the little one. I put a big one on and I fill my large intestine with a liter of water. Mm -hmm. And then over 45 minute period, it empties into this long pouch. Yeah, and then I can go the next 23 hours, next 24 hours with 
no movement from my bowels except for a little it's called irrigating it's perfect <laughs> <That's> exactly <laughs> what it is <sighs> and i'm sure you know as you've had it over time it just becomes like a natural part of your day you mm-hmm. know and do you feel like any more resistance to it or are you now just like yeah this is this is part of my morning so it's part of my morning routine i've been meditating since i was about 20 maybe nine, since I heard about it. I mean, I mean, I mean, we started meditating as children and we were like, you know, five, our parents brought us to TM, you know, transcendental meditation classes. And then, you know, I forgot all about that. And then I was a teenager and started, you know, reading cool books and hearing about meditation immediately. I'm like, what is that? And my dad had always meditated, but he would meditate, you know, with the ball game on with his little you know, transistor radio earbuds going in his ears. So I don't know how much that was meditating, but for him it was, it, it worked, you know, it was a quiet moment. So it always been in my life. So my point is I'd meditated through my life, but once I got the irrigation process down, what happened is that became when I would meditate. And so then I just meditate every morning. I fill myself up with water and I meditate. And meditation practice, I love that. Yeah, I mean, and it brought my meditation practice to me mm-hmm. and made it a daily routine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, I could be sitting there reading. I could be doing lots of things as I did when I first started. But now it's just like, no, this is when I meditate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your question was, what's it like for me now? So there are times now when, you know, occasionally my bowel will move midday like any other person, right? I mean, sometimes your body just like, whoa, <laughs> excuse me, got to go. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, it's just, you know, the next 24 hours of no issue with it. And there was a question you asked me. I'm just curious if you if you feel like you're living in acceptance mm, of yes, it. Yes, thank you. Or if Absolutely. you're resisting still. Like if there's, you're like, God damn, you know, I have to do this again. And I can see how it can be frustrating. And I can also see how, you know, when it just becomes this natural, like, part of your routine, that there's sort of a sense of acceptance and that might come with that. Yeah, so there is a kind of like an S curve that happens in my intestine where it meets, where it exits the abdominal wall. That little part that pokes out is called the stoma, S-T-O-M-A. And just after the stoma looking at me and going in, there's a little S curve and the intestine can actually go over and in itself and cause a block, not a block is like to the bowel, it's a health issue, but it stops the water from going in when I'm irrigating. And so sometimes I will spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes trying to get the water in. Little goes in, a lot comes out. Little goes in, a lot comes out. I actually, now I'm so comfortable with it. I'll put my finger in there and straighten out the S curve and put more water in and it still doesn't work. And then after 20 minutes of that, I now empty out this sleeve full of water into the toilet and reclip it closed and go back, you know, wash my hands up, go back and fill the IV bag with water again and do sometimes I have to do it three times this morning I had to do it twice Mm -hmm. and there are times I have to be somewhere and I have to go to a meeting so here's the thing Bethany like I can't control when I pass gas and if irrigating doesn't go well there will still be stool in my bowel and then I will pass gas from that and if I have to go to a meeting where it's going to be quiet Mm -hmm. I've never been comfortable just passing gas in a meeting I'm not that guy and it's happened to me before and I get really embarrassed and I'm learning to just like whatever. I don't turn completely red now. Now it's partly red, but there's some resistance because I'm like, no, I have somewhere to be. I have no more time. I had a late night getting prepared for this. And now my bowels arguing with me. I'm like, ah, and then I just, you know, when all that builds up, I'll take some deep breaths and I'll just let myself feel the frustration and I'll let myself feel the wishes for my life, not being what it is. And then I'll just be with what's so. And then get taken over by more wishes that it wouldn't be this way, you know. And, and the whole process, just allow it and just, maybe I'll shed some tears, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've always been a big fan of crying, you know. It's, people say, yeah. why are you crying? What's wrong? I'm like, well, nothing's wrong. I mean, I'm sad. I'm crying, tears, laughter, you know. They're wonderful emotions. And so crying comes easy for me. And mm-hmm. sometimes I'll shed some tears or, or I'll feel pissed. I'm like, this stinks. And then I always return to, like, this is my life. I can choose this or I can resist it. Mm-hmm. And you know, give myself 
the space I need to express my wishes for it to be otherwise, to express my frustration, and then return to, like, you can choose what you got, you can keep hoping for something you don't, and yeah. I'm alive, you know? Like, it's it sounds so cliche when people say that, but, like, if it wasn't for colostomy surgeries, like, there's a good chance I wouldn't be alive right now. My bowels sure as hell wouldn't work. They'd be, they would have been a mess between radiation and chemotherapy. So yeah, I appreciate you asking that. Yeah, there's times I wish I didn't have it. Mm -hmm. And then there's times that I'm somewhere and I spill something on my shirt and so I just stand up and I pull, you know, not inside, like see if it's outside, like on a picnic table and I pull my shirt off and I'm cleaning it off and I, I can see people are like, whoa, what's that? And kids will walk up, you know, they'll yeah. immediately ask, you know, they're great. My, my son's, my little guy, when he was in like elementary school, I took him and his two friends swimming because they lived across the street from us. And one of the girls looked at me when I took my shirt off to swim. She's like, what's that? Yeah. And I said, you have, you have to promise to laugh if I tell you. She goes, okay. Oh. I go, it's where the poop comes out. And she's like, what? <laughs> so I explained it to her. And she's like, okay. And she looks at me kind of inquisitively and goes, so you don't need your butt, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, from that point of view, not at all. Nope. It serves no, other than it stands me up and allows me to walk. But, you know, and from where you're coming from, no, I don't need my butt anymore. She's like, oh, and laughed, and off we went into the water and swam and had fun. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just, it's just part of who I am. I have a girlfriend that I met through that organization, First Descents, on a whitewater kayaking trip, which is a whole chapter in the book as well, because I was so inspired by her. She had a soft tissue tumor that was growing into her spine, into her low back. Mm. and had surgery and ended up being handicapped. She lost the use of her legs from the surgery. Oh my, that's a huge loss. And so that was, I mean, gosh, to go through cancer and then have that life change so quickly. It was like a 20% chance of that happening. So it really, you know, she said oh. it was off her radar. But this girl was phenomenal. She's, she's on this trip. She's like one of the best whitewater kayakers of all of us. She's, really? she's fucking rocking it. And what happened with her surgery is because she has no feeling, you know, below her waist, she can't go to the bathroom um, or pee on her own really. So they rerouted things in her body so that she, she pees out of her belly button. And so she's like, wow. oh, yeah, it's so cool. She was like, yeah, the other day we're all in kayaks. I just pulled over to the side and, you know, took my little tube out and emptied her in the water. You know, and I was like, that's amazing. And and she, you know, she learned to find peace and acceptance with it. And and as someone who, you know, I use the word disability. I don't it's not true. Like she's fully able. She can I mean, she drives a car. She lives on her own. She's got her own business. It, it's amazing but yeah i just i just enjoy learning you know learning oh, all the, that's the different incredible parts that yeah go through and then don't you ever think about like in terms of western medicine like who first of all thought of this in the first place like hey why don't we reroute all this and then who is the patient that was like i'll try it first <laughs> <laughs> you want to like, reroute my bladder uh, out my <laughs> belly button. Yes, sign me up. Or you, yeah. you want to reroute my bowel oh, out my never, abdomen. And you've never done this before. Okay, like I think that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that is incredible. It's <gasps> and thank you, whoever tried that first, because it keeps getting perfected more and more. You know, each year, right? For, for us, when I had my metastasis of the metastasis to my liver mm -hmm. i was a patient at a clinic and hospital called you know the guthrie clinic it's here in uh, new york state like the main campus is just south of the border in pennsylvania and when i was diagnosed the doctor that i saw he was the person who invented this liver surgery who created this process where it's kind of gruesome where they attach like electrodes to your feet. They make sure you have the other, you know, I have hoop earrings and they don't really come out very easily. So they had to remove those and they had to find out if I had any other metal in my body because they attach electrodes to your feet. And after they, you know, I'm giving you like the, the dummy version. I don't exactly know, but you know, yeah. but what I recall them telling me is electrodes on the feet and then they cut away the part of the liver that they need to remove. And then they put a paddle on that and they use electricity to just sear the end of it and sear it. 
closed because otherwise, you know, you can't just cut the liver. It's not going to heal itself that way. And this guy was the one, the doctor I was seeing, who I, he, I didn't go with his surgery because I ended up going to Memorial Sloan Kettering for reasons, for instance, like, you know, there's drainage tubes they were going to send me home with from the Guthrie Clinic and the, and the Robert Packer Hospital down there where when I asked the doctor at Memorial Sloan Kettering, about those when he didn't mention them. He goes, oh no, we don't use those. We figured out a way to do the surgery, so that's not necessary. And they said enough things like that where I was like, okay, I'm going with Memorial Sloan Kettering. But this doctor had come up with this, like what had him think, oh, we'll just yeah. sear it like a steak. You know, my next thought was like, what's that smell like when you're working oh, there? You know what I mean? Like what, what do you no <laughs> longer eat because you just yeah. don't want to ever smell that when you're eating, you know? But thank you because you yes, thought of it thank you because <laughs> otherwise what would they have done would they have just given me tons of chemo like i had a an hepatic artery pump and it's also called the kemeny pump because my doctor down in new york at sloan kettering dr kemeny she invented this pump it's just about the size of a hockey puck a little bit bigger and they insert it under the skin on your abdomen and it runs chemotherapy into your hepatic artery goes straight into your liver so in addition to the systemic chemo that you get pumped in through your veins every couple of weeks, I also would have this hepatic artery chemo. And she invented this tool so that with the use of body temperature and atmospheric pressure, it pumps chemo into your body. And it's always pumping. So as long as you have it, when the chemo's not in, they need to fill it with a saline solution. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And when my how treatments long, were... Yeah. How long did you do that? It pumps for like a week. I did a seven-month chemo treatment of, mm -hmm. it'd be two week. it'd be two treatments of the systemic chemo through my port. Mm -hmm. And okay. then I'd get my blood tested. And if I qualified for the hepatic artery chemo, they'd fill up my hepatic artery pump. And I'd spend a week with that, which was a treat because it was far less and nauseating just, and sickening and that, than chemo. You're, you're at home for it? Mm -hmm. right. Well, you know, yeah, you go in, they, they inject it just kind of like the way right. they do a port. They, they yeah. inject it into it. And then when that week is over, they stick a needle back in, they pull out whatever remains, and then they fill it with saline. So it's still pumping saline into your liver. It's not an issue. And you get your regular chemo. And then when treatment was over and I was cancer-free and I had my scans every X number of months, and they'd fill it with saline. I'd go in and get it you know, in six weeks. I'd have a th scan every three months. So after six weeks, they'd empty it out and fill it up with more saline. And then once I started doing scans every six months, and now every, or I don't even know if I got to every year, but every six months they would fill it with glycerin because the glycerin pumped more slowly because they didn't want it to empty out because then it would like backfill with blood and then it could pump a blood clot out into you and like, I don't know, kill you or whatever. So they didn't want that to happen. But like this woman invented this phenomenal device that uses, there's no batteries, it's body temperature and atmospheric mm -hmm. pressure to pump chemo into your liver so you can have an alternative treatment. And she only sees patients who have had rectal cancer metastasized to the liver. No rectal mm -hmm. cancer patients, no liver cancer patients. It's just this yeah. specific thing. And she's dialing in. The reason she Love invented it. it, yeah, it was because I was like, you know, when I saw Dr. D'Angelica, he said, you know, I usually don't see patients like you. And I'm like, uh, why? He's like, no, because like your surgery is just standard procedure. It's not difficult. I often see patients who have multiple lesions throughout the liver and they have to, he has to determine with Dr. Kemeny, you know, like which ones he can remove and which ones will remain. And then that, you know, hepatic artery pump in tandem with the work he's done, you know, gives extra treatment to remove those tumors. And uh, I think it's kind of sweet that I was that patient for the both of them because they deal with people whose cancer diagnoses are pretty rough. You know, this is something where, you know, their hospital says, you know, we can do so much, we'll do our best, you know, and then they go to mm -hmm. Dr. Kemeny and Dr. Angelica, Dr. D'Angelica, and they're like, we think we can take care of this for you. So when Dr. Kemeny sees me beaming because my scan came back negative, I can tell by looking at her face, I have a sense, you know, that it's a real sweet thing for her to have a patient who's doing great, you know, because she's, she's down in the trenches. And these yeah. people invent these extraordinary devices. It's phenomenal. And, you know, it was hysterical when I had a port just under my, what's this called? The clavicle? Yeah. And then I had, stage. yeah, I had the, uh, you still have it? No, it's not, oh. no. And I had the, <laughs> had the hepatic artery 
pump in my ab- on the right side of my abdomen, and I had my colostomy pouch on the left side of my abdomen. I have this huge <laughs> scar from my sternum all the way down to like as far down to my pelvis as it can go. It's like hysterical. Yeah. And uh, it's we are as as much as we would like to have not gone through these diagnoses. A, I can already tell with you. You know, it's obvious. You know, we're both clear. We would not be who we are. We may not have turned out to be who we are right now and it was our journey it was our path but like even that aside like without these incredible tools and approaches they come up with like you know we wouldn't be here or what would your friend's life be like if they weren't able to redirect the emptying of her bladder and she would have Mm -hmm. to just what like just wear a diaper her whole life Mm -hmm. like she's free inside of the you know these constraints that she's been handed like She's free yeah, now. It's and, and beautiful. She, and she, it's also a conscious decision to be free because she could choose to be really pissed, you know, Absolutely. and angry that I have to deal with it. Like, and we all can, but there's not one ounce of me that wishes cancer didn't happen for me. Me too. Not one ounce. I'm so grateful. And she said the same thing. Oh my goodness. And I was like, Ooh, like, I mean, just, it was such a moment. I remember sitting in a cafe in Missoula and eating breakfast burritos and I and I was scared to ask her this question because I'm like it's easy for me to say cancer is a gift like I had some boobs replaced and like you know wasn't told I have two months to live and like yeah it's way easier for me and then paralyzed from the waist down and can't pee for myself and And then I asked her I was like so do you think like has it been a gift in your life she's like oh yeah and I go if you could change it like and you know if you could change it and have I don't know how I asked it, but if you could have yeah. never gone through it, like, what would you choose? She's like, oh, she goes, my life is so much better because of cancer. She's like, I'm so much mm. better person. She goes, I wouldn't change a thing. And I was like, oh, you're amazing. Sobbing. <laughs> you're amazing. Hey, maybe yeah. I'll get her on your podcast, actually. <laughs> She'd be a really I've great person to talk to. I was going to ask if you'd be uh, willing to reach I out to her. Definitely. Definitely Absolutely. Will. And for all of you who are listening, I just want to say for all of you who are listening, like if you're pissed off that you have cancer, like yeah. I'm clear and I'm no authority on this, but I'm really clear that there is not a thing in the world wrong with that. If you are pissed off, you're pissed off. And yes, yeah. be angry. Like there's no one way to navigate a cancer diagnosis. And you know, how we respond to our diagnosis is how we respond. It's 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 your life, it's your experience, and you get to say how your life is gonna go. You're just you know, for me, there just came a point where I was like, you know, if there's going to be limitations on my life, for instance, if I don't survive this diagnosis or if post-cancer my body is not what it once was, which became the thought later on, I'm going to live my life. And, you know, it's like when my former wife and I split up, I was telling Bethany, for those of you who are listening, we spoke briefly before this podcast we'd never met before. And I let her know that my former wife and I are, we're super close now. I, I love her dearly. But when our marriage ended, it was horrible. It went badly. Neither of us did well. We're going to have a podcast where we talk about caregivers and we're going to include how unskilled and unprepared we were to navigate a cancer diagnosis as the diagnosis put a microscope on all the areas of our lives, of our relationship <laughs> that wasn't working, right? The exact and so, same thing. Yeah. It was like a flashlight on it where it's like, you can't ignore this anymore. <laughs> anymore. And there came a point after our marriage yeah. ended where I just couldn't be angry i was furious i was Mm -hmm. so angry i'd never known what hate felt like and i was like this is the most horrible feeling i don't want to feel this i wouldn't smile in public because i didn't want her to possibly see me and think that i was happy i wanted her to be punished Mm -hmm. and i'm going through this negativity and misery but really to the point like the anger about it just it ate me up so much that i finally said like, no, thank you. And I called a buddy of mine. And I said, we got to talk about forgiveness. I know you've been trained in forgiveness. What does forgiveness, how do, you, how do I do this? And he said that his teacher taught him that forgiveness is giving up the right to resent. It's giving up judgment. Mm-hmm. And I spent a week like, how do I give up the right to resent? Like, what am I giving up? But what, I have this, I feel I have the right to resent her. And... And as I'm addressing people talking about being angry about cancer, if you are, it's like, you know, you get to say. And the question that really made a difference for me was, what is it? What am I getting out of resenting her? And I realized I felt it was my only leverage that I had to get her to behave differently. 
And I burst out laughing and thought to myself, I'm the last person on earth that has any leverage in getting her to change the way she's behaved. I behaved like an ass for years. Like I was furious and hurt and I would act, behaved like an ass before we split up. You know what I mean? It's like, and I just burst out laughing and I took on the forgiveness and called her and told her and had to re-forgive her probably 50 times until it became a familiar and natural place of being. But I just found that the anger was too much. I didn't want to carry it around with me anymore. And it's like, you know, we all have the right to be angry and to stay mm. angry. And, you know, of course, and I just look at like, how is it working for you? You know, is it, right. is it enriching your life? Is it, and that might be for some people, I don't know, but, but just like you realize, like it was just a really painful place for me to stay in. And, and I, you know, I still use that process of the work to, to deal with anger. And, and I had a lot of anger for my, my husband at the time. And it's, it's a big part of the book too, is our, you know, our story. When we met in our twenties, it was just such like this beautiful romantic novel of meeting and then going off to Europe. And like, we just had this beautiful love affair. And just like you said, when the cancer diagnosis hit, you know, at first the possibility of in that diagnostic period, just having the possibility of me having cancer was actually really connecting for us. It was like this, we came together, we were like embracing every moment together. And I was so excited. I'm like, wow, this could be like something that really brings us closer at what this is incredible. But the moment I chose Western medicine is, is when there was a, a divide uh, mm. between us because he, he felt I should be doing it naturally. And he was reading all the online stuff you know, that supported that. And so, and he was someone who hadn't taken an aspirin in years. So, you know, to go from that and then the love of your life is now doing wild doses of supposedly poisonous <laughs> chemo and, and steroids and, you know, all that, like it was really hard for him to, to come around to making peace with that. And then from my perspective, it was really hard. I didn't feel supported by him, mm -hmm. but, but that whole process just really highlighted dynamics in our relationship that were alive before cancer. But like you said, it's like, boom, it's in your face and you can't ignore it anymore. And so for me, it came to be a process of, you know, I, I would judge him in work and, you know, there'd be a belief like he's not supporting me, you know, for example. And it was so interesting to, to sit in that inquiry and many, you know, about him where like when I believe that thought he's not supporting me, it's, it's like all I can see. You know, I only see the times where he didn't do this. He didn't do that. I was excited. He shat on it with a mean comment. He like, I just could only see the struggle. Right. And then when I stepped into question four, who would I be without the thought? He's not supporting me. You know, I start to see like so many ways he was. And, you know, he would make me a green juice every morning. <laughs> was, hmm. Hey, those juicers are hard to clean. He would do it every morning. You know, he was trying to find, he was saving money to fly off to Mexico to save my life. I didn't know that until later, Aww. but it was like, he, he just cared. Like he, he loved me and he supported me. He chose to stay with me, even though he didn't agree with how I was handling, you know, the treatment plan. And that's, that, that's big. And so I started yeah. seeing all these other ways where, wow, that support is there also. But then when I got to the turnarounds, you know, one way to turn around, he's not supporting me. I turn around to myself. I'm not supporting me. And I saw, you know, where I was doing this to myself. Like I would tell my, the moment I heard, oh, you know, well, chemo can kill you. It's, it only, you know, creates cancer and kills you is, is a really popular statement in alternative medicine. And, you know, he would say it and <laughs> here I am getting infusions. And, and then I believed it. And I told myself mm. I'm doing it wrong. I told myself I'm like ruining my health. I'm setting myself up for a lifetime of side effects. You know, that's the script running in my head. That, that's on me. So I'm not supporting me with, with these beliefs, you know, as well. And then I found ways that I wasn't supporting him. I mean, he was really struggling and I, you know, I threw certified facilitators at him. I was like, go get support. Just go, go, you know, like I've got <laughs> enough shit here. Like you need help. And it took him about a year and a half to finally say yes to that. But at the same time, like I wasn't supportive of, of his experience of cancer, which is to be honest, harder. I, I think caregivers can have a harder experience with cancer 
than the person going through it. And, and that was our experience where, first of all, there's one level of no control. We can't control if this cancer goes or stays. We hope that all the stuff we're choosing to do medically will cure it, but we don't know. So there's that unknown. And then for him, but I got to make choices. You know, I had a sense of control of yes to chemo, no to this, yes to that. And he did not have that power either. So it was like this double lack of, of control that, that, you know, was even harder. And, and he also had a history of, of loss, you know, with amazing women in his life. So mm. it really like, oof, it was rough. It was really, really rough. And that form of inquiry supported me. And then eventually he, he turned to using it as well, where he was able to finally see, oh my gosh, the treatment plan's working. <laughs> the tumors are shrinking oh, and like, wow you know, and, and join me in that, in that joy. And it took a really long time, but I'm, I'm such a proponent. I mean, everyone needs support in this process, not just the person going through cancer. Everybody needs it because everyone goes through their own version of this cancer diagnosis. And so, you know, I, I put that in the story because one, it was a big part of my own personal experience. And it also, you know, it taught me to trust myself and making my own decisions where I have a history of just, you know, oh, if my parents say it's this way, then that must be right. Okay, if my partner says it's this way, that must be right. And and not really looking within um, mm-hmm. for my own answers. And it really, I trust myself now in that inner guidance instead of looking outside. And that was a big lesson that he gave me, you know, not intentionally, of course, where I really like, I've, I've now turned to myself and I'm giving, I have, this past year and a half, I've given myself a brand new life. I had a beautiful life before too, but I've given myself an even more beautiful one. I moved out to the mountains in Boulder, Colorado. My younger brother lives out here. They just had a baby. So I have a baby in my life because <laughs> I know I'm not going to have mm. my own. I'm in a new relationship that I absolutely love and adore. And, you know, I go on adventures and skiing and hiking and, and just live life to the fullest now. And I just realized that that's my job. You know, that's not my partner's job. That's not somebody else's. It's, it's fully, fully on me. And right now, cancer free physically, uh, also mentally, emotionally. And how long physically, physically, it'll be four years in April. It'll be my, I know I lied five years in April. That's big. Yeah. I think yes. Five years in April. So they count, you know, they like, it's not when treatment ended. It was when I had the double mastectomy was when there was no evidence of, of disease after that. But I still had a lot more treatment after that. So that's exciting. Yeah, the statistics drop a lot after five years and then 10 years. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's just such this motivation of, of live life now. And, you know, why why wait is really like, I use I use death as not a scare a thing to scare me or anything i just i use it as an inspiration to live fully now me as well because we never know we really yeah. nobody ever knows i could i keep you know. death in my breast pocket i always yeah. keep death very close to me to remind myself that death can happen anytime like you know like you said like with your former husband you you saw where he was being a support for you and you had missed all of that I missed it. and you I saw what it. yeah what what you were bringing to a relationship that was having it not work and having keeping death close by has me ask myself you know you know or presence myself to the fact that life is short life is precious and can be very short and you don't get any say and we like to say you know people shouldn't die when they're young and there shouldn't be you know all these terrible things that happen in life and i'm like okay maybe but what I see happening is that it's happening all the time, all over the it's world. Happening. Is it heartbreaking? A hundred percent. Do I wish it wouldn't happen? My ego wishes it wouldn't happen. Yeah. But these things happen and keeping death close to me has me recognize that this time is precious and to treat it as such. And I, you know, I also look at like our stories about death, like death is bad. Hmm. Death means you failed in some way. It's, you know, you lost the battle is the cancer language if, if you die. And I, and it's just not that for me. I, I started studying death. I got really interested in it. And then my, my grandmother passed away. I don't have a lot of experience with it. My grandma Mm -hmm. passed away a few years after 
cancer and just, you know, old age in a nursing home. And I was there for that process of like watching the body, you know, stop working. And, and I just thought it was such a beautiful transition. And I mean, we're all going to die. Nobody's getting out of that. And I think it's so fascinating that we don't, you know, it's like not a big topic of conversation or people are afraid to talk about it or, you know, we all have a story that death is bad, but like none of us have died. So how the fuck do we know that it's it's a bad thing? And then I look at people who have had those, you know, they said they've died and they've come back or near death experiences. And there is a very common story with a near death experience. And it's that, you know, when they moved into whatever other realm, they experienced the most all encompassing sense of peace and love that they've ever experienced. And it's like mm-hmm. everything like became one and it was a beautiful experience. And so I, that's a common story I hear. And so again, like we come back to our imagination right now, nobody knows how we're going to die when this, that, what it will feel like. But if I'm going to live in imagination about death, why not go with that great all encompassing <laughs> peace and love? That's our worst case scenario here. And I'm like, it's not so bad. Now, do I choose, like, if I can push a magic button and choose to have a long life and grow old and wrinkly and all those things? Sure. Right. But, you know, there's no, there's no button for that. So, so why not live it now and, and not fear, fear death? Grow up with something that happens to all of us. Yeah, all of us. Yeah. You said earlier, you know, people say, you know, someone had a, died of cancer. They lost the battle. Like, mm-hmm. I have friends who passed away from cancer and they had cancer but cancer did not have them yeah they were a survivor and i wouldn't use the word survivor and i resisted the word until i spoke with a guest about he said for him i call everyone survivors whether they're alive or dead Mm -hmm. because you know these people are they survived it and you know it's my evaluation that says you know some people survive the diagnosis while they're alive and other people don't but what do i know i all i know is my own experience it's really had me just recognize like the word survivor like cancer may have taken your body but you don't have to have cancer take away your joy your experience of life your gratitude for life you can't touch any of those things no you can only let it body yes but none of those other things Mm -hmm. so tell us i want to know about this amazing book like i've thought of writing a book and i haven't written a book well, maybe maybe we'll talk sometime after the podcast soon and you can talk to me about how you did it. Because I'm really curious. Like, I have yeah. this book envisioned in my mind and I'm like, uh, yeah, I also don't know how to climb Mount Everest right now. In the mm-hmm. podcast, I'm doing this and I love this and I'm thrilled and I, I couldn't even write a book right now if I wanted to. Oh, I'm sure there are points, in, you know, when you first had the idea of the podcast, you're like, I'm not going to be able to figure all this out or had, you know, doubts, self-doubts about I learning the process and doing it and look at where you are now. So you've already proved yourself wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so right tell me, there. when was it in your life? What was happening when you said, oh my yeah. gosh, I'm going to, not I'm going to write the book, but I'm going to write the book and you started manifesting well, it. Well, like, like you, I was, I had a blog going. So I started writing, first of all, I've always just loved writing, period. I'm not trained in writing. Did I take writing classes? I just have always loved journaling. So when I was in that diagnostic phase and and started diving into the work, I was so inspired. I would wake up at 2 a.m. It's it's like I would take a nap from sleeping from 2 to 5 in the morning and just I had to write. Like it couldn't have come out of me fast enough. Like I was just like, get it out. Like I'm experiencing so many incredible things. So it started then and then I made it into a blog. So I used the blog for many different reasons. One was, it was just my way of updating everyone on what was going on. Cause as you know, like people care and they reach out and ask questions. And this way I didn't have to answer the same question like a hundred <laughs> times. So it was like, Bingo. Was, everyone's on the same page. This is what's going on. And then I would share my inner work of how I was using inquiry in all the various parts. And I started getting, you know, really great feedback. And then people would find me that had, you know, over in Japan and had a cancer diagnosis and they read something that that really helped them. So that was an inspiration then to to keep writing and sharing. 
And just the process of writing itself was so healing. I mean, it helped me come to realizations and process things and honor all those crazy emotions. So I loved the therapeutic part of writing. So so I wrote throughout that whole journey. That's two years of a blog. And then I, I knew I always wanted to turn it into a book, but I wasn't quite sure how. And of course, like, you know, I'm not getting paid for any writing or turning it into a book. So it's like, I also have to work and make money because my bank account went to zero with cancer. But um, so anyways, there's all of that running. And, um, and really what, what got me was a dream I had. I had a dream where I was very vividly dying. And I was, I was in a hospital bed in the center of a roller skating rink which Mm. was weird. And around the rink was like everyone I've ever known in my life. And I could see them. And the doctors told me that the cancer spread to my rib cage and my sacrum and there was nothing more they could do and to get my affairs in order and, and, and hear those news. And I remember like, it was so vivid. I was so there. And I, I just, was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is that thing that I was fearing. It's it's happening. Like this is dying. And I, and I would watch my breath started to slow down. And like, I started feeling weak. I was like, oh my God, this is, this is dying. It's, it's happening. And it wasn't, I had acceptance around it in the dream. It wasn't fighting. And then I was pushed around the rink and I'm like touching hands and seeing tears and eyes and just connecting with everyone for the last time saying goodbyes. And then I was wheeled into, like, through these doors, like sliding glass, I don't know if hospital doors, but I'm wheeled through. And then all of a sudden it hit me, this realization was, like, wait a minute. You know, before I heard those words that you have, you know, if there's nothing more we can do, I felt fine. And then I hear the words and my breath shortens and I all of a sudden feel weak. Like, I was fine before I believed that I was dying. And then it was this big, like, oh my God, I, I'm not dying right now. I'm actually, I'm living <laughs> right now until, you know, that last breath. But right now in reality, I'm living. And then there was this surge of like, I'm going to make the fucking best of this time that I have left. Then I get wheeled through these doors and there's this old boxy computer. That's like the first computer ever born. You know, it looks like, and I mm. get wheeled in and all I see are the words, right write the fucking book. And I was just like, and I snapped out of my dream. I woke up and it was just one of those like disorienting, wait, that wasn't real. Oh, okay. Husband's next to me. I'm in bed. Like, holy shit. And it was just so clear, write the book. And so that's when I started diving in and I used the blog as kind of a backbone of the book. And then I weave in and out of time. Like, you know, my, I lived in Spain and taught English for a bit and that's, you know, supported in the book and how I met my, my previous husband is in there and, and just how like all these past experiences really trained me to, to go through the cancer journey. So it does like flop back and forth and it is, it is an over share and a half of Hmm. my life. Like I can't believe I put the shit in here or I'm like, Oh my God, anyone can read this. And it's funny because I'll run into people who I've never met and they're like, I read your book. I feel like I know so much about you. And I'm like, you do <laughs> you know so much about me. But at the same time, like, I really think it can help people find a different way through cancer and, and learn how to find that joy, that happiness now. You know, cause I, I, none of us know if, cancer is over, you know, even when you're pronounced cancer free, it can come back, who knows, but my priority is, is finding, you know, peace, regardless of what my body or anything is, is going through. And so, um, this is the how, you know, I found it. And so it can be like a companion where there's a how to part where anyone reading the book will know how to use that process of the work and, and anything stressful in life and then just, you know, embarrassing stories and funny mm. ways of looking at things and, you know, just, yeah, my, my very authentic experience, but it was, it was scary to put it out there. So it came out last month and I just remember being like, Oh my God, like oh, people are going to read this <laughs> and it's so much. And, and of course, when I wrote the book, I was married and, and, you know, I, 
wasn't quite sure if it would work out between us when I was finishing writing the book. So I left it kind of ambiguous about that. And so I did not anticipate releasing a book and not being in that relationship anymore and, and being with a, in a new relationship where, you know, uh, my current partner is reading, you know, all about my sex life about with my <laughs> husband. And so are his parents and, you know, all these <laughs> his friends. I'm like, oh, my gosh. But it's it's amazing that, um, you know, both my ex-husband and current boyfriend, they're both so supportive of this book. Like they understand Aww. that it's something I have to do and that it's helping people and that they're both just really proud. And I think that's amazing. Amazing um, says a lot, you know. To, to both of them so yeah it's out there it's it's on amazon it's also a kindle version i really right. want to do an audio version i just tell them the title again uh, it's called my guru cancer and then the subtitle is you don't have to fight to find true freedom from the c word yeah and her name is bethany webb i'll tell you what uh you speak about everyone now knowing this about you and, you know, as these podcast episodes are released, I'm like, oh, my gosh, people are going to know, like, everything about the most intimate details of my experience. <laughs> and it's, it's like, well, that's just what has to be. And, and now you're just going to put it in words on paper. Yeah. You're, you're, already, you're already living that. <laughs> and when my marriage was ending and I was going through the diagnosis... I was writing songs, you know, I used to have a four piece, mm -hmm. you know, like outlaw honky tonk country band. We'd play my tunes and I'd write these tunes about, you know, this one song I wrote uh, called, uh, I still can't believe that you're gone. Mm -hmm. It was just all about how, like, I thought we were in this for life and now you're gone. And another song I wrote, the turnaround line in the chorus is, you know, I'm going to keep on hating you until I don't love you no more. Mm -hmm. And I said to one of my buddies, I'm like, now I'm going to release these songs to the world and people are going to hear this. Like, I, 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 this is so vulnerable. And he just looked at me like I was crazy. And I'm like, what? He goes, listen to any song you hear on the radio. What do you think they're singing about? And I was like, holy courage. Yep. Like I was so lost uh -huh. in my own place in my mind that I was like, wow. To and say are those the songs you connect to the most? Bingo. Exactly. And so when people read your book, they, they're not getting the filtered version of you, the refined version. They're getting the raw, real you, and that's what people connect to, and that's what people love. You know, we can appreciate a story and how it, you know, is similar to our own experience. But when we hear the real truth, and you just open it all up and hand it to everyone to do with it what they will, people can relate to that. You know, I think Brene Brown really brought that to the world, to the mainstream world. You know, we work so hard to hide who we really are. That way people will connect with us the way we can feel connected with others. And the reality is the more we tell on ourselves around the areas of life where we are feeling shame, mm -hmm. the quicker and more beautiful the connection is with others. Mm -hmm. And you are providing that with your book. Thank you. And that's wonderful. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading it. I really am more of a audiobook person. I really don't read. I do with touch, but I, I, I've read probably on average about three to four books a year. And in the last three or, let's say three years since I started getting into audiobooks, I've probably listened to two to 300 books. Like the number is, maybe it's 150 to 200. The number is outrageous. And I'll listen to it for five minutes here, 20 minutes there, just like I do podcasts, you know. I never listen to the whole thing at once with the podcast, and especially not a book. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea. Of you creating an audio book. I did a reading uh, at the, did like an online book launch because we're in COVID and <laughs> everything's online now. <laughs> but I did, I read a few of my favorite passages from the book and I just realized how fun it was to read it out loud and, you yeah. know, the voices and you can ad lib parts of it. It sounds so fun. It's just a matter of figuring it out now. <laughs> yeah. Because I did it choose in. to self publish this book. I, I tried the traditional route of you know having a nice book proposal plan and polished manuscript and I tried shopping it as much as I could to get it traditionally published and it was it was a no-go and mm -hmm. I told myself you know if by June of of this year so 2020 if there wasn't a clear direction for that book that I was going to publish it myself and so yeah I hit that and I actually I love it because when you self-publish 
which we can always chat about um, when you're ready to write your book. Yeah. It really gives you full creative freedom to do it how you would like. And like you get, you're in charge of the title and the cover and how it's presented. I own all of my words so I can use them however I, you know, feel. I also, this is my work now is, is working with, with people on and one-on-one coaching. And then also I have some online class series, like making peace with disease that take people through this, this process of the work and, and finding peace in, in any area of stress. So, you know, I am my own little business now. And, and with, when you self-publish, you own the rights to all of that, which is really nice. I didn't realize that about self-publishing. I thought I have to get picked up by some major publisher for it to get out mm. there. And it's getting out there and you're helping me <laughs> literally right now wonderful. just by yeah helping me share share the book and share share this message. So I'm yeah. thrilled to if you if you published with a publisher, they would have some rights to your words like you'd have to get permission or there'd be some kind of agreement you have to make so, about using your yeah, own like words. Yeah, like if I wanted to take you know, um, a paragraph of my book and, and put it in some online advertising or, you know, like I'm, I'm I use social media all the time. It's super fun, but I, I don't know if I could always just make that choice myself. I might have to run it by someone. Gotcha. Wow. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about that. So yeah. tell everybody about the work you do and what it is you do and what you provide people. Yeah. So um, I'm a mindset coach is, is what I call myself now. <laughs> and I work, through one-on-one, so individual coaching, or I offer these six or eight week online class series that are just an intimate small group around different topics. So it's, you know, that process that I shared the work, that's the main tool that's used in all of it. And it's breaking free from any area of stress in life. And just because of what I've been through with with cancer, I tend to draw in a lot of clients that are dealing with various health challenges. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one class, for example, is there's an eight week series called making peace with disease. And, and that takes everyone through this curriculum that's laid out in the book. It's what I went through. It's, it's how I freed myself of cancer, but it's all different kinds of conditions. And what is so cool about it. And I co-facilitate it with another friend who's certified in the work. She had HIV and use mm. the same process of, of finding a beautiful, incredible life because of HIV. So clearing wow. her mind of all the stress. And, and what we both realize is that even though our conditions are different, that mental, emotional journey was, is so similar. And so we have people join the class with, with all different kinds of diagnosis. They're from different ages. They're from all over the world. Yet we see this commonality of where the mind goes, you know, when you're, you hear those, when you toss that curveball, And so it's really powerful to, first of all, feel that connection. Like I'm not the only one who thinks this way, thank God, because it really feels isolating. Like I'm the only one going through this. And, and then we're just learning from each other as we, we start to all capture our beliefs that are creating stress. And, and it's in a lot of different areas. It's set up to, you know, catch the beliefs that you're having about your diagnosis. So I have cancer and that means, you know, my life is over. My life is limited. I can't do X, Y, Z. You know, we've got this whole beliefs of the meaning of cancer. And then it dances through um, judgments about doctors and medicine and treatment. You know, like it sounds like we both had a lot of maybe some fears around, around Western medicine and beliefs about big pharma and, you know, all of that. Um, you can also have stressful beliefs about alternative medicine too, that, that you can, can work. So it's, you know, it's a free space for whatever is part of your journey you can work on. Um, also relationships is a big part and finding those stressful thoughts about where you feel people aren't supporting you the way you'd like. Um, there's a whole week where we judge God or the universe, you know, for screw you for <laughs> giving me this thing in the first place. And, and those kind of beliefs. And then we look at those worst case scenarios and, and invite them in and, and question them as part of it. So it's always a really beautiful journey together. And, and there's mm. some other classes like making friends with medicine that I teach because that was such a big thing for me. Uh, and also a self-love series. And then, you know, whatever else happens and shows up. But those are kind of my consistent things. And then I do have a membership program. And that's a monthly membership that... I really created for myself 
as an ongoing practice because like all this stuff is great and then I find that I just stop doing it so this monthly membership is there's mm. every week there's a new meditation a new yoga practice and then a, a live inquiry circle where we meet and do the work so the yoga and, and meditation recordings that are sent and there's a every week and there's a new theme and so it what it does is just allow people to have like a monthly fee and they get a new thing every week a new focus a new practice just to keep it as an ongoing thing as opposed to like a big intensive which those those six and eight all right it's like an accountability like a yeah. form of accountability that, that it, it, it just kind of keeps keeps you going keeps reaching out to you and keeps connecting it sounds like yeah. you have a wonderful series of uh programs oh, I, and i love and, all of it so much oh, like i can't even tell you it's such a it's and such so a joy. good yeah there you go you love your life i really love my life <laughs> yeah. yeah and it you know it, i wouldn't have the same life if hadn't i hadn't i gone through cancer so. yeah so tell the listeners mm -hmm. you know they've heard the four questions yeah. you know, they, can, they can write them all down what's mm -hmm. the benefit of working with you versus just having the questions for themselves. Yeah, well, I love that you can have those questions for yourself and do the work on your own. And I would recommend it as a written meditation, writing out your answers. I, I notice when I do it in my head, like I'm grocery shopping in five minutes and it's super inefficient, mm -hmm. um, but it can be a beautiful practice with yourself and inner support system and working with a facilitator. And one like myself, I've, I've been where you've been. You know, I, and I have experience both in, in feeling those terrible, overwhelming, all-encompassing emotions and fears. And then also I know what's on the other side with this work. So it can be really helpful to work with a coach and it is, it, anyone, <laughs> but it can be helpful to hold yourself accountable to doing it. So we schedule a session and it happens. You're paying for it. So you're going to get your money's worth. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then to, yeah, have that mirror, you know, working with you. Sometimes people get stuck in, in that process where they can't find an answer of who would I be without the thought, or maybe they can't find examples in that turnaround. And, you know, I can be here to offer some examples from my own life that I discovered. And, and often people will, that'll open a, a new way of thinking for someone. Um, but yeah. yeah, so mainly accountability and connection with, with someone who's been there. And it, I love the process because it's totally, totally available for free for you to make your own practice anytime. And, and Byron Katie's website is thework.com and, and she has instructional videos, worksheets, like it's all available for free. And I love that. Of course, there are trainings too, but she literally makes freedom free. Hmm. So I always like to tell people that. And there's also a helpline actually on her website. And I've called it and I, I called it in that diagnostic phase. I was a certified facilitator, but I called mm -hmm. the helpline. And I was like, oh, I'm dying. Please help me. And it's there. So, so it's all available. It's just a matter of, of, you know, it's finding what works best for you. Yeah. And you called that helpline and what that communicates to mm -hmm. everyone is that we can know how to do the work, we can know the steps, we can even be trained in it, mm -hmm. and circumstances arise in life that seem more than we can handle. And for most people, for everyone I know who's been diagnosed with cancer, like that's what it was. And when they can reach out to you and have you support them in doing the work, and when they, like as I like to say, often said, you know, when they're seeing in black and white terms, it's either one way or the other way, and there's no other option. Not only are you trained in working with them in such a way that they then see that there are far more choices than just the two, but you also have the experience and the wisdom that you bring that, you know, I know for myself as a coach, you know, I can hear people saying things as they're beginning. You know, I'm not going to steer the conversation it's their conversation i'm only there to reflect mm -hmm. do the work that i do with them to support them and seeing through it but you know you can hear them start to say certain things and you know it'll just resonate with you it's like yeah okay i i'm, I'm getting this fully like you know and they're talking through it but y you've been there you know it and what they might not be seeing i mean i don't, I, I don't know about you but for me i certainly never give advice in the in my sessions but what i will do is i will ask questions about what it seems like they don't see and sometimes let me go, okay, because that's not there. But other times it opens up this whole yeah. area they weren't looking and it's just, it, 
I can hear, you know, the incredible benefit there would be to hiring you and working with you to to navigate a difficult life circumstance with the work. So thank you for being available. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's it's my privilege and, and it was a big learning for me too. I'm I've you know, have always been just this do it herself. You know, I have been self employed for twelve years and like do it herself, girl, figure it out. Like don't count on other people and cancer was was such a beautiful lesson and no it's okay to reach out for support and people are so fucking happy to help you oh, and want to help you want and to so you're giving them a gift <laughs> to be to receive that support is giving you know them a gift as well so and i and there's no like of course there's probably like there can be a stigma around asking for support like it's a sign of weakness or you know and that's just another bullshit thought it's bs you know, that was me, 100%. Yeah. It was me, 100%. It was a huge breakthrough when I yeah. finally asked for support, when I found that I wasn't going to explode or die or in the world. People weren't going to hate me when I asked for support. It didn't mean I was a failure as a human being and as a man. No, it's, it takes mm. courage. It's actually the opposite it of weakness. It's courage, it's strength. Right. Yeah. So what is your website? Tell everyone your website. It's my name. It's bethanyweb.com. And that's W E B B yep. dot com. Yep. And you're on social media? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's at Bethany Web Yoga. It's on and Instagram that's and Facebook. Instagram and Facebook. No Twitter? I haven't done Twitter yet. I think I have a mental block on Twitter. Oh gosh. <laughs> Bethany, I have a Twitter account. <laughs> so many people are telling me and, to do it. And oh, YouTube, and I'm like, Ugh. I just put my <laughs> stuff on Twitter and I don't look back because Twitter is like, it's like the whole world of everyone's opinions about everything. And I go there and it's like, no, no, thank you. Because I am a deeply sensitive human being. And when I read people's upset and anger and fury and judgment, I'm just, it's just not my thing. Like I don't watch the news that much because I will get yeah. upset and I'll get mm-hmm. angry. It'll steer me. And I'm like, I just don't want to give myself to that. But I do post on Twitter and then I just run away real fast. <laughs> and now I found that on Instagram, I can, you know, click the Twitter button. So it'll go to Twitter and it sends a Twitter post and it includes my link. Oh, I don't yeah, even need to yeah. go to Twitter now. Oh, and I, funny. <laughs> and so you know, per, I was posting, you know, actual posts on Twitter. Now Instagram just sends it and says, go to Instagram and see what, you know, but seriously, the cancer podcast posted. And, you know, I may get back. I imagine, you know, maybe I'll get back into Twitter, but I was just curious because it's a, yeah, it's a, no, it's, it's, it's a funky on one. my list on my list i i love those social media stuff like i i post every day and i've had a super fun time with you know i i joke that it's a book baby like i gave birth so i had a whole some pregnancy photos with my book and there was a a birthing video maybe and then now i'm taking photos like as if like you know she's she's in a little bouncy carriage or being pushed in a stroller i take her in the backpack on hikes and so like it's just my whole Hmm. uh it's just hilarious and fun. I think we'll try nursing soon and maybe potty training. <laughs> but I've just been like a huge dork. <laughs> so it's My Guru Cancer and it's on Amazon. So go buy the book. And Bethany, it has been wonderful mm-hmm. getting to know you. This has been such a great conversation. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank it. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in. I truly hope this podcast was of value to you. Please subscribe and let your friends and family know they can find But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast, anywhere podcasts are made available. To learn more about my cancer survivorship coaching, please go to BertScholl.com. That's B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-L-L.com. If you'd like to support But Seriously, the Cancer Podcast to ensure we continue to provide the best quality episodes for our listeners around the world, Please go to our Patreon page at patreon.com. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash but seriously, the cancer podcast. See you all in the next episode and thank you so much for listening. The intro and outro music you hear is the creation of Saint Kid. You can find him on social media as The Saint Kid. The purpose of this podcast is to provide a platform for individuals to discuss personal experiences with a medical diagnosis. The host and guests are not medical professionals, and the podcast is not intended to provide medical advice or psychological therapy. Whenever there is a concern about mental or physical health, please consult a qualified medical professional.